The North Carolina Democratic Party is an association of like-minded individuals who support and also in, uh, de help develop policies that uh, they agree on or that they mostly agree on. It's made up predominantly of uh, registered Democrats. Okay. And what are your duties as chair? The full duties as chair of the North Carolina Democratic Party are spelled out specifically in what's called the plan of organization, which has appeared for many years in the state manual published uh, by the Secretary of State for a long time. But in general, the duties of the chair involve the following, but not in any specific order, is to uh, organize uh, the counties and congressional districts for uh, Democrats to help recruit candidates, to help raise funds for the mission of the North Carolina Democratic Party, to help develop a message, uh, to help uh, be a, a, a voice also for candidates and support candidates, and then to uh, do what we can uh, collectively as the Democratic Party and as individual members of the Democratic Party to encourage voters to support our candidates and help develop uh, public policy for the benefit, uh, greater benefit, of North Carolinians as a whole. Are you paid for your work as chair? No, sir. Okay. Uh, what are the basic purposes for which the North Carolina Democratic Party exists? basic purposes are again to help uh, in, encourage like-minded folks to come together uh, to help to recruit candidates and to support candidates who favor those policies and favor the, the, the development of policies that Democrats support that are not only for the mission of the Democratic Party but also uh, to help North Carolina as a whole and to persuade voters to support uh, the nominees of the Democratic Party uh, during the general election. If I may also add, you asked about compensation as chair. I do receive some uh, reimbursements for mileage and the like, but there is a, a non-paying full-time job. So what does the uh, Democratic Party have to do to achieve these purposes you just identified? Well, uh, we need to have as many volunteers as possible. Uh, we need, as a party, to accomplish the, the, the mission, uh, have good candidates that we recruit and that we support. Uh, there needs to be uh, enthusiasm for the party and its candidates and its message and mission. There needs to be uh, uh, the appropriate financial resources to get a message out uh, and the things that are involved with elections. And then uh, it's, it's vital that we have fair, non-discriminatory district lines for the candidates that run in districts across the state. Those are the things that we need to accomplish our mission. Thank you. Uh, let's uh, move to a little bit different topic, uh, Mr. Goodwin. Um, North Carolina has had two sets of redistricting maps this decade, uh, one that was Set enacted in 2011, declared unconstitutional in 2017, and revised laws enacted in 2017. Let's first focus on the 2011 maps. Would you describe for the judges the impact the invalid 2011 maps had on the ability of the Democratic Party to achieve the purposes for which it exists? It had a tremendously negative impact on the ability of the North Carolina Democratic Party to achieve the purposes for which it exists. Uh, first of all, you know, we had, like in, the, in 2012 and 2014 and 2016, uh, it was uh, more difficult to recruit candidates. It was more difficult to raise the funds necessarily. Uh, enthusiasm was down tremendously because of what uh, was considered by, by uh, candidates and by the party as uh, unfair rigged districts. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the I guess, the actual outcomes, uh, we saw the uh, Republican legislature draw lines that led to Republican supermajorities uh, during those years in uh, 12 and 14 and 16, 2012, 2014, 2016. Uh, notwithstanding Democratic legislative candidates 
uh, which were the nominees for the North Carolina Democratic Party, uh, receiving approximately 48 to 48, 48 and a half percent of the statewide vote, uh, believe that that uh, that resulted in about 36 percent of the legislative seats, and it was very uh, difficult and challenging for us as Democrats uh, to to run and to recruit and to uh, face. Uh, what we believe to be rigged districts during those years. Uh, in 2017, the districts were redrawn. And uh, would you tell the court how the Democratic Party viewed the upcoming 2018 elections after those districts were redrawn? Well, in for the 2018 elections, by that point, uh, it's my understanding that the uh, that the legislative leaders, the Republican um, supermajority, in crafting new district lines, had to unpack uh, districts that had been designated as having been uh, packed with African American uh, voters, African American Democratic voters, and that we knew it was going to be still a difficult, difficult race because of what we believed still to be unconstitutional uh, district lines. Uh, during the in the 2018 election, uh, believe that approximately 50 percent or so of the of the of the votes were cast for Democratic nominees, and still significantly less than that wound up being elected uh, in the uh, in the legislature 2018. Uh, in contrast to 2014 and 2016, where during the unconstitutional maps at that point, uh, there were uncontested races of like 30 races and uh, in 14 and, and I think in the House and nine in the Senate. And then I think in 2016, it was like uh, 31 and six thereabouts in the House and Senate respectively, uncontested races because of the way the lines are drawn. Uh, notwithstanding that in 2018, we were able to recruit uh, Democrats to run in every legislative district. Uh, but we still met a seawall in 2018, uh, one that, uh, that I believe was established to do two things. Uh, one, to prevent and protect, or to, to protect the Republican supermajority, and then a seawall that in the best of years uh, for Democrats and the worst of years for Republicans, a seawall with the drawing of the district lines so that at a minimum would protect the Republican majority. Um, everyone, and myself included, knows that 2018 was considered a blue wave election for, for the legislature and across the country. And notwithstanding our very best efforts on, in every level and every, and every measure, uh, we were able to breach the seawall and the supermajorities, barely in the Senate, but we still, despite everything going our way, the lines are drawn in such a way that we could not uh, breach the, the seawall that protected the Republican majority. So your efforts and your enthusiasm and your money did not translate into seats, is that correct? It, it did not. I mean, notwithstanding the tremendous palpable level of enthusiasm uh, that was there, and notwithstanding having candidates running in every race, and notwithstanding uh, raising the, uh, the most funds raised for a midterm election uh, that we've seen in North Carolina uh, for the Democratic Party and, and out raising uh, the Republican Party for legislative races and notwithstanding uh, the, uh, the fact that we had there was a Democratic governor in a unique partnership assisting us, um, we still were unable because of the way the lines were drawn to breach that seawall that uh, that protected the Republican majority. So, uh, Mr. Goodwin, we've talked about uh, the impact of these lines on the uh, ability of the Democratic Party itself to meet the purposes for which it's organized. Let's talk a few minutes about the impact of those lines in those maps on the members of the Democratic Party. Uh, first, uh, how many uh, registered Democrats are there in North Carolina today? At last 
look, it was well over 2 million registered Democrats in North Carolina. It may have been close, maybe closer to 2.3 million, but it is the, it is the uh, political party in North Carolina that has the most uh, registrants. And second, uh, you have unaffiliated voters, and then third, uh, Republican uh, voters that are registered. Are there members of the Democratic Party in every House district, every Senate district, and every precinct in the state? Uh, yes, there are registered Democrats in every precinct in the state, uh, every county in the state, every House district, every Senate district, yes. Uh, can you share with the court uh, your views about how these lines in these maps have harmed the members of the Democratic Party itself as contrasted with the, how, the, how the lines have harmed the members of the party as contrasted with the party itself? Well, the, the, the single most important legislative act every 10 years is what's re required by the Constitution, and that, and that is uh, the uh, redistricting. And that should be done in a way that is not partisan. And then when the lines are drawn in what should be an, a, a fair way, a non-discriminatory way, then members, elected members of the legislature can then decide based on their own policy preferences and their constituent, uh, constituent base and what's for the good of the, their districts and for the good of the state to decide policy developed from that. The way the lines have been uh, drawn even for the 2018 elections uh, has impacted our members in that we've had to expend extraordinary amounts of time and resources and the like in a way that in a, uh, in a set of fair maps across the state we wouldn't, uh, wouldn't have had to do. Um, another example is that the way the lines have been drawn for 2018, uh, there are districts, uh, there have been districts that where Democrats, because of their uh, political affiliation, have been packed into districts, and that has created uh, wasted votes, uh, in my view. And, uh, and then there are districts that were drawn as part of the Republican plan to protect their majority and their supermajority where, where uh, Democratic communities uh, and precincts were split apart uh, such that those votes were worthless. So that's, that's in part the impact. Let's uh, talk a minute about another topic, um, Mr. Goodwin. Um, there's been a testimony here about so-called support scores. Um, do you know what a support score is? Very generally, I mean, uh, I mean, from what I understand, support scores are based on consumer data and individual voter data, but I, I, it's not something that I have worked with. Okay. Um, do you know what use is made of these support scores? It's my understanding that support scores are used for uh, if, if they're used at all, I guess would be used for mailings, <coughs> used for, for uh, walking around to visit uh, registered voters, okay. voter contact. Are they used for campaign purposes? Campaign purposes, yes. Does the Democratic Party re require candidates to use support scores? No, sir. Okay. It's up to the candidates and their campaigns? It is up to the candidates and their campaigns to determine uh, whether or not such support scores will be used. They're made available, but um, that's, that's it, made available. To your knowledge, uh, does anyone ever use, does any campaign or candidate ever use aggregated support scores for a pur any purpose? Not that I'm aware of. That's not an animal that really exists. Are support scores ever used to evaluate the partisan performance of districts? Not that I'm aware of. Uh, what tool is used to evaluate the partisan performance of districts? It's my understanding that we use what's called the DPI or Democratic Performance Index, and uh, that is not unique. Uh, the, uh, I'm, 
confident the Republican Party has its index and that there are many organizations that are involved in politics and elections that have their own indices, whether they are partisan groups or business or industry, nonprofit, you name it. But DPI, the Democratic uh, Performance Index, is what, uh, what I'm familiar with. Your Honor, if I may hand the exhibit, a couple of exhibits up to uh, Mr. Goodwin. Yes. And I'm going to hand two up, uh, and then I'll ask him, ask him about those. And you need one as well. Thank you, sir. Um, then let me hand out the second exhibit. Sorry for the bulkiness of the exhibit. Good one in front of you is Plaintiff's Exhibit 646 and Plaintiff Exhibit 647. Uh, 646 is the clipped exhibit, 647 is the thicker exhibit in the three ring binder. Are these so called district snapshots? Yes. And were these exhibits provided to the uh, defendants as a part of their discovery request in this case? Yes. And did your staff put these exhibits, these documents together? Yes. Looking at exhibit 646, could you tell the court generally what's in this document? Looking at plaintiff's exhibit 646, uh, which has the state senate district snapshots. Mostly what appears on each district snapshot uh, is based upon publicly available data, um, such as voter registration, demographic makeup, um, and, the, and the like. Um, there's also a block in here that's designated 2018 expected DPI. Democratic Performance Index, and that uh, is based on the results of past elections, and et cetera. And does Exhibit 646 contain a separate snapshot for each of the 50 Senate districts? Scanning through that exhibit, yes, it does appear and in fact has something for each of the individual 50 state Senate districts. Okay. And looking at exhibit 647, Mr. Goodwin, is that, does that contain essentially the same information as exhibit 646 except for the House? Yes, Plaintiff's Exhibit 647 uh, provides a district by district snapshot of the 120 state house districts, providing the uh, uh, similar information uh, as in the Senate districts, except for the house districts. Except, for the except these are house districts. Uh, and again, uh, just to be clear, there is a snapshot for each Senate district and a snapshot for each house district. Yes, that is correct. And for each House district and each Senate district, there is information included on these documents regarding the expected DPI for each of the districts? For each of the district snapshot pages, there is a block that, is indi that indicates a 2018 expected DPI for each of those districts. And what does DPI stand for? Democratic Performance Index. And what is that used for? Well, it, it, it shows for, I guess, election purposes, it shows the uh, past Democratic performance 
uh, based on previous election results. And in this instance, it, uh, because of what's happening, it, it shows based upon what the old lines were at the time, uh, because these are for 2018 and the elections immediately prior to 2018 were under different district lines. Thank you, Mr. Gooden. Cross-examination? Yes, sir. Uh, good morning, Chairman Gooden. Good one, uh, Mike McKnight, uh, for the legislative defense. Good morning. Um, you consider people who are registered Democrats um, or registered to vote as Democrats to be members of the North Carolina Democratic Party, right? Yes, based upon the Democratic Party plan of organization for North Carolina. Uh, Yes, based upon the plan of organization for the North Carolina Democratic Party, members are uh, registered Democrats. And to hold office in the Democratic Party on any level, you must be a registered Democrat, correct? To hold office within the party, you must be a registered Democrat. And you are suing in this case on behalf of all registered Democrats, correct? I, uh, the party is suing on behalf of registered Democrats as well as on behalf of itself as an association, which we were allowed to do. All right. And if I say you in the course of our conversation today, of course, I'm referring to the North Carolina Democratic Party because I understand that you're here testifying on behalf of the North Carolina Democratic Party today. Is that right? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, now, registered Democrats outnumber registered Republicans in the legislative districts that are being challenged here, don't they? So that we state the question, please. Sure. Registered Democrats outnumber registered Republicans in the legislative districts that are at issue here. Is that right? Well, I do not, I do have not analyzed and recall each individual district. I mean, it may vary from district to district, but on the whole, there are more Democrats registered as Democrats, more people registered as Democrats in the state than Republicans or than unaffiliated. All right. I want to hand you an exhibit that takes a look at this issue, if I may. Could I approach you? Yes, sir. Yes. All right. And do you remember in what context? Just in, in reviewing uh, documents for the trial. Okay. And I'll represent to you that this is a chart that was created by the legislative defendants using voter registration percentages that were found in the 2018 district snapshots that we just looked at that the North Carolina Democratic Party produced in this litigation. And we have identified for each district the political party of the candidate who was elected from that district in 2018. And so I want to turn your attention then to page four of that document, which is marked as legislative defendants TX 280-4 in the bottom left hand corner. There are totals for each column that appear at the bottom of the page. And according to these totals, if, if, if you're having trouble finding it, I'll be glad to wait. Do oh, I see it? You see the total? Okay. So there are totals that appear at the bottom of each column on the page. And according to these totals, there are more registered Democrats than registered Republican or unaffiliated voters in 61 House districts. Is 
that right? It's what it appears to be on this document. Assume, assuming we've counted out the districts correct. Is that a fair statement? Assuming that, correct. All right. And based upon the numbers we just looked at, Democrats hold a registration advantage in a majority of the seats in the North Carolina House of Representatives. Is that right? Hear that way, but as I know as chair, and I would expect to be common public or public knowledge, that too many people that are registered to vote don't vote, and too many people who should be registered to vote aren't registered to vote. So just registration, uh, it's, it's a different uh, measure than turnout. Okay, but the question was Democrats hold a registration advantage in a majority of the seats in the North Carolina House of Representatives. Is that right? Based on this document, that appears to be the case. And Republicans only hold a registration advantage in 41 of the 120 districts in the North Carolina House. Is that right? Assuming the data is correct, based upon this document, that would appear to be the case. Okay. And it appears that unaffiliated hold a registration advantage in 18 of the 120 districts in North Carolina House. Is that right? As stated before, assuming this information is accurate, that would appear to be the case but in, in this document. And assuming the information in this document is accurate, it's also fair to say that Democrats or unaffiliated voters have a registration advantage in a total of 79 districts in North Carolina House. Is that right? If you were to look at the math alone, that would appear to be the case. But as I stated earlier, registration percentage does not equate with uh, actual voter turnout or voter performance, which the indices uh, reflect upon. And it is it would be grossly inaccurate to equate all unaffiliated voters as having the same uh, policy and candidate preferences as Democratic voters. Yeah, I, I don't think I've done that, Chair Bill, so I apologize if I'm giving you that impression, but that, that's, that's, that's not where my question was going. So, in looking at the 41 districts where Republicans have a registration advantage, I don't see but one district, and that's House District 78, where Republicans make up a majority of the registered voters. Do you agree with that? Notwithstanding the fact that there are a number of districts where Republicans are just under the 50% mark, your statement would be accurate, but it would be incorrect uh, to, to say that without looking at how close they are to the 50% and the percentage of unaffiliated voters. But 
based on your question, as I believe you stated it, the answer would be yes, but there are more factors looking at your own data that would need to be uh, understood as part of that analysis. All right. And if there is only one House district where Republicans make up a majority of registered voters, then that must mean that Democrats or a combination of Democrats and unaffiliated voters make up a majority of the registered voters in the other 119 House districts, right? It would, it would seem so, but again, Democratic registration is not, or, or Republican registration or unaffiliated registration is not the same as performance. All right. And the last page of this document contains voter registration totals for the North Carolina Senate. And that page is numbered as Legislative Defendants TX 280 6. Can you please turn to that page? 280-2. Yes. And according to the totals on this page, there are more registered Democrats than registered Republican or unaffiliated voters in 24 Senate districts. Is that right? It would appear that way, yes. All right. And Republicans hold a registration advantage in 20 of the 50 Senate districts. Is that right? Based on registration, it would appear to be the case, yes. All right. And because Republicans only hold a registration advantage in 20 of the Senate districts, that means that Democrats or unaffiliated voters have a registration advantage in 30 of the 50 Senate districts. Is that right? If you're only looking at registration, but performance is what I think is key in making a proper analysis. Well, you included registration uh, on your uh, district snapshots and looked at them all the time, is that right? The district snapshot so shows the total voter registration, and then it shows by percentage the demographic makeup by party, gender, race, and age. Okay. So, looking at the numbers at the bottom of legislative defendants, is it two eighty dash six? fair to say that a combination of Democrats and Democrats and unaffiliated voters make up a majority of the registered voters in all 50 Senate districts. Is that right? Based on registration, that would appear to be the case. But that, again, registration alone does not tell the whole story. All right. And since Republicans make up a majority registered voters in only one of the 170 districts under the 2017 plans, a Democrat could be elected in 169 of the districts in these plans without getting a single vote from a registered Republican. Is that right? That is a, an extreme hypothetical assuming that everyone who's registered for his or her respective party actually voted and voted only based upon their party registration, and assuming that unaffiliateds all voted for the Democratic candidate. That is not going to happen. Now, you would acknowledge, Chairman Goodman, that during the 2018 election cycle, there were efforts by Democrats on a national level to flip as many state legislative districts as possible from Republican It is part of the mission in every election to elect as many Democrats as we can, uh, and the hope being to elect them in fair, non-discriminatory districts. Um, 
I'm aware of other organizations that are not affiliated with the Democratic Party of North Carolina that uh, apparently have those goals. All right. And isn't it true that members of the General Assembly who were part of the House Democratic Caucus and the Senate Democratic Caucus decide which legislative seats the North Carolina Democratic Party should focus on in each election cycle? In many respects, yes. The caucuses, you know, the caucuses serve two functions. There's the, the House and Senate Democratic caucuses serve a, a legislative role where they work on developing policy and determining uh, committee work and messaging on legislation, both proposed or, or against legislation that they believe is antithetical to, to, to their mission and to the better of North Carolina. Then you have the role of the House and Senate Democratic caucuses, which is based on or focuses on uh, elections and recruiting candidates, and uh, by and large, a, a component of that would be recruiting candidates and looking at districts that that uh, that have, I guess, a, a Democratic performance that might lead to changing a district from Republican to Democrat. Ultimately, it's about persuading voters on policy and on the strength of good quality Democratic candidates to win the day. All right. Well, both the North Carolina House Caucus and the North Carolina Senate Caucus, the Democratic caucuses, that is, maintain accounts under the umbrella of the North Carolina Democratic Party. Is that right? Yes, for many years. They have, the, they have done so, yes. Okay. And those accounts are reported in the North Carolina Democratic Party's campaign finance reports. Is that right? Um, by law, they're reported to uh, the state and uh, federal regulatory authorities. Now, isn't it true that in 2018, the North Carolina Democratic Party, which includes those caucuses, raised more money for its state accounts than at any time in its history? For a midterm election, we uh, did incredibly well in fundraising in partnership, uh, unique partnership with Governor Cooper and based upon the enthusiasm that we had, but notwithstanding uh, raising almost two to one, I believe, uh, or, or at least a significant millions of dollars more than the Republican Party in North Carolina, that we still hit the seawall of not being able to, to break the majority. Uh, it just it was, for a blue wave election, uh, it was stopped in its tracks by those two walls that were erected. Chairman Goodwin, can you name an election cycle before 2018 in which the North Carolina Democratic Party raised more money than it did in the 2018 cycle? I cannot. I mean, I've only had one midterm election during my time as chair, so, so I only can reference the 2018 elections. Do you remember looking at the results for the 2016 election in the deposition? Yes. Do you recall that? North Carolina Democratic Party raised more money in 2018 than it did in 2016, which was the presidential year? It appeared to be the case. Uh, of course, there are different district lines involved there and, and the like. So I believe that's the case, but that, was, that predates my time as chair. All right. Now, you testified today that you thought that the North Carolina Democratic Party had to spend additional money as a result of 2017 district lines. Is that right? Yes. Okay, but you can't quantify how much more money the North Carolina Democratic Party has to spend as a result of the district lines being challenged here. Can you? Well, a lot of the quantification is something that I would defer to the subject matter experts that have testified previously in this matter. Uh, but it, to me, with what you have proposed in your question and what you shared with me in the documents during the deposition, uh, about how many millions of dollars more the Democratic Party raised than the Republican Party for the legislative races in the midterm elections, it boggles the mind to know that despite all those things going in favor of the Democratic uh, legislative candidates being a blue wave election, a historic blue wave election, raising those sums of money, having candidates in every race, uh, the enthusiasm uh, that given the lines you're talking about that you think would, would benefit Democrats, they, that the Democrats still were not able to elect uh, a majority. They hit that seawall. All right. Now, I think you, you just hit on this a moment ago. I think you testified earlier that during the 2018 election cycle, 
Democrats feel the candidates in all 170 legislative races, is that right? Yes. Okay, and that was the first time in history that that's ever happened, is that right? Yes. All right. Now, you also testified about what you call the blue wave of 2018, is that right? Yes. All right, but you can't say how the so-called blue wave of 2018 compared with the Republican wave that occurred in 2010. Well, actually, I can say this, is that in 2010, when the red wave washed up ashore, um, Republicans were able to uh, elect a legislative majority in both chambers here in North Carolina using maps that the Democratic legislative uh, chambers had drawn previously. That is in stark contrast to the way the maps were drawn by the Republican uh, majority since then. Do you know what percentage of the statewide vote Republicans received in 2010 during the red wave? I do not recall, but I imagine there's a document somewhere that has it. Would it surprise you if it's 59%? It was a red wave. Okay. And would it surprise you that the Democrats didn't receive more than 51% in 2018? I believe that is correct. 50.5 to 51 percent. Um, I believe that is correct for 2018. And isn't it true that the North Carolina Democratic Party believes that the power to draw legislative districts should be taken from the legislature? Should be taken from the legislature? Should be taken from the legislature. The North Carolina Democratic Party and its individual members speaking in, in, in unison have in our state party platform that we believe in an independent registering commission that would require the legislature to put forward a constitutional amendment. It then would be up to the voters of North Carolina to decide that. We have had, we have had supported an independent registering commission for many years and e you know, even in years when Democrats were in the majority, which goes back again uh, more than 10 years ago, much more than 10 years ago, uh, the Democratic Party has stood for an independent registering commission, and that cannot happen unless the legislature acts. So it's not, say, taking it from the legislature, it's uh, asking the legislature to do what is right and best for fair, non-discriminatory districts in the state in partnership with the voters who would have to adopt it. All right. Now, isn't it true, uh, Chairman Goodwin, that taking the power to draw legislative districts away from the legislature was a talking point that was used by the North Carolina Democratic Party after the districts being challenged in this lawsuit were adopted. It was, it was used before that. Uh, and the idea of using your phrase, taking it away from the legislative authority, taking it away from the legislature, I believe those were the words or the actions or the intent that the Republican Party had uh, even into the early 2000s. So uh, it is, this is not a new concept, but I think given all that we know and all we've seen and how now with the recent drawing of lines using methodologies and computer software and experts who use, uh, I guess, whatever uh, plan they have in place that are much different than were used, than were used by the Democrats, uh, I believe a majority of North Carolinians, including Democrats, would support an independent redistricting commission because we need fair, non-discriminatory district lines. All right. Well, let, let's take a look at, at, at an email. Uh, I think we looked at your deposition uh, to be clear about uh, when this occurred. Um, if I may approach your honors. Yes, sir. Chairman Goodwin, uh, 
this email, and this is the email that it's identified as an email that was produced by the North Carolina Democrat Party. It's been numbered uh, NCDP 26506. I believe that's up on the screen now. Now, do you recognize this document? I do. I believe you presented it to me during the uh, deposition in May. Okay. And this email was sent during the time in which you were chairman of the North Carolina Democratic Party. Is that right? Yes, sir. About, uh, it appears to be about five months into my tenure in 2017. And it was set on August 21st of 2017, shortly after the 2017 plans were enacted by the North Carolina General Assembly. It appears to be the case, and of course I'm not listed on this email, so I wouldn't, I did not receive it until you showed me a copy during the May 2017, de 2019 deposition. All right, well, let's talk about who is on the email then. Uh, the email was sent by someone named Scott Fallon. Is that right? Yes. Okay, who is Mr. Fallon? He is the former executive director for the North Carolina Democratic Party, and he is a political consultant, campaign consultant. Okay, and, and he's all... He, uh, he, is, he is the former executive director of the North Carolina Democratic Party, and he is now a political campaign consultant. Okay. And he was also involved with a group called the Democracy Project, too. Is that right? I do not know. You don't know either way? Uh, I, I don't know either way. I don't, know, I don't have any personal knowledge of that unless you show me a list of some sort. Okay. And you don't know whether the Democracy Project, too, was involved in funding redistricting litigation in the state in the last decade? I would need to see a list. I don't recall. Again, I've only been chair since 2017. Okay. Now, let's look at the people that email was sent to. I, I believe Ms. Kimberly Reynolds, she is the uh, immediate past executive director of the North Carolina Democratic Party. Is that right? Yes. And then there's Casey Wilkinson. Who, who is Mr. Wilkinson? It's one of the uh, caucus uh, staffers. Okay. He, which caucus is he a staffer? I think it was the House. Okay, and then there's Ryan Deer. Is he Sen so, uh, the other caucus director, yeah. Okay, the Senate caucus, right? I believe so. Okay, and, and so one of the points that Mr. Fallon wanted Ms. Reynolds, Mr. Wilkinson, and Mr. Deer to make is the third bullet point down. You see that? <coughs> would, would, would you read that third? That way it's not a bullet point. Would you read the third sentence from the top? The third sentence after the line that says here are some points to be made says, quote, the power to draw districts must be taken from the legislature or our democracy is doomed, unquote. All right. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman Goodwin, you don't know if the North Carolina Democratic Party is challenging the county briefings as they appear in the 2017 plans. Can you repeat the question, please? You don't know if the North Carolina Democratic Party is challenging the county briefings as they appear in the 2017 plan, do you? County briefings? County groupings. Groupings. Uh, what I do know is that we are challenging individual districts and the maps as a whole statewide. That's what I know myself. As for any other uh, matters, I would defer to the pleadings uh, of the various parties, including the Democratic Party. Including. I would defer to the pleadings of the parties in the case, which includes the Democratic Party of North Carolina. All right. Um, now, you don't know whether the North Carolina Democratic Party considered the Democratic Performance Index numbers testified about today and decided whether to bring this lawsuit to you? Uh, it, it's my understanding that the North Carolina Democratic Party, of which I am chair, uh, would have pursued this litigation regardless of what happened in the 2018 elections. Even if we had pursued successfully and won a majority in the 2018 elections, there's still a matter of principle that we have stood for and have been fighting uh, for in the courts for a while. All right. Um, well, let's talk about the Democratic Performance Index numbers then. You, you would agree with me, Chairman Goodwin, uh, that even if a district has a Democratic Performance Index that's under 50, 
it's still possible for a Democrat to win that district right. Depending upon other factors, I mean, it's, I mean, anything's possible, but there, you know, the, um, there are many ways to uh, discern or describe or to calculate a district as competitive. Uh, but I guess it's what you've said is possible, but that's excluding all other factors. Would you agree with me that if a district has a Democratic performance index under 45, it's still possible for a Democrat to win that district? It is possible, but it's also possible that one of the Democratic performance above 50 could lose a district. All right. Would you agree with me that uh, it's possible that even if the district has a Democratic performance index of under 40, it's possible for a Democrat to win that district? I, I, I can't say for sure because I, I would need to know other factors. Okay. You don't know if there's a district where that occurs? There is, I imagine you'll point it out to me. But I don't, I don't know off the top of my head uh, on my own recollection. question. Um, Mr. Goodwin, are you aware of any responsible politician in the country who predicts election results based, based on registration figures? No. Thank you. And, Your Honors, I would move into evidence exhibits 646 and 647. Any objections? Uh, no objections to that. Thank you, sir. You may step down. Thank you, Your Honors. Who should give these? Those are, I think the clerk has her copy, so those are, ex those are counsels. Thank you, Your Honors. Thank you. Further evidence for the plaintiffs? Yes, Your Honors. Plaintiffs call Dr. Wesley Pickin. William Perdue, P E R D U E. Please remain standing. Place your left hand on the Bible and raise your right. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give this court shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you out? I do. Thank you. You may be seated. Sorry, can I get. Uh, those reports. I wanted to bring a copy of my report up. Sorry. Thank you. Thank Pegdom's P E G D E N. 
ask why we have a moment just Mr. Speaker, some of the documents that were just in, that were introduced, well, whoever can answer this, uh, some of the documents were marked as confidential subject protective order, and it's been our practice to place on the website, the public website, any admitted exhibits. Is there any objection to those documents being placed on the no public objection. website? All right. Thank you. Your Honors. Good morning, Dr. Pegden. Good morning. Would you please state your name for the record? Yes, it's Wesley Pegden. And where do you work? I'm an associate professor at Carnegie Mellon University in the Department of Mathematical Sciences. Um, let's please pull up Plaintiff's Exhibit 509. I'm sorry, uh, Professor Carnegie Mellon? Yes, associate professor at Carnegie Mellon University in the Department of Mathematical Sciences. Um, what are we looking at in um, uh, Plaintiff's Exhibit 509? This is the first page of my CV. And is this a fair and accurate description of your qualifications and experience? Yes, it is. So I see from this CV that you received your uh, PhD from Rutgers in 2010. Um, what field is that in? So uh, I work uh, quite broadly in mathematics, but my main areas of focus are in discrete mathematics. That's D-I-S-C-R-E-T-E. Mathematics and uh, probability. Um, can you tell the court about some of the journals that you've published in? Um, perhaps you can talk about the first three publications that are on the publications list in your CV here. Yeah, so the first article you see here, Assessing Significance in a Markup Chain Without Mixing, uh, this is a paper we'll uh, talk about. Um, so this is published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes. This, this was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, which is a top science-wide journal. Uh, this next paper was published in Annals of Applied Probability, which is one of the top probability journals. And uh, this next paper was published in Annals of Mathematics, which is one of the top math journals. Um, have you written about Markov chains? Yes, in that first paper that we mentioned. Can you describe generally what a Markov chain is? So a Markov chain is essentially a random walk around some abstract space, and that space could be almost anything. So for example, um, if I consider a person who is taking a random walk around a city from intersection to intersection, each time this person shows up at an intersection, they choose randomly which road to follow it down. This would lead them to randomly walk around the city, and the position that they're in over time would evolve as a Markov chain. Uh, the way Markov chains are coming up in this case is that you can have these random walks over any space, in particular over the space of maps. So in this case, instead of a place in a city, you'll have a map, and the way it's walking around this space is by having small changes being made to the map. So as I make change and change and changes to the map, this map is moving around this space of possibilities. And have you published any papers that use Markov chains to analyze redistricting? Yes, that first paper from this list, assessing significance in a markup chain without mixing. At this point, let's pull up Plaintiff's Exhibit 510. What are we looking at here? This is the first page of that paper. And um, I think you, you mentioned where this, where this paper was published. Um, was it peer reviewed? Yes. Um, and what's the general subject of this paper? Uh, so. The general, subject, sorry, the general subject of this paper is what I would characterize as a, a third way of doing a statistical analysis, and specifically applying that third way of doing that statistical analysis to the problem of detecting gerrymandering. Can you describe how that third way relates to the other two ways? Yes. So suppose that we have the problem of wanting to show that a given object is an outlier compared to a set of possibilities, right? So maybe you have some big box of things, and somebody's given you something from the box. Sorry. <laughs> somebody's. Yes. Oh, I apologize. You have a big box of things, and somebody's given you something from the box, and you want to know if they gave you a typical thing from the box or something very unusual. Okay. Uh, the first, uh, perhaps simplest thing you could try to do is simply look at everything in the box and decide by doing that whether this one you were given 
is very unusual. So that's, I'll call that the first method of doing an outlier analysis, um, looking at all possibilities to determine whether the one you're evaluating is an outlier. The second thing, uh, which is uh, sort of the most common basis of statistics, is in lieu of actually examining every single object in the box, to instead draw a random sample from the box. Right? And here, random, any time I use it, means something precise. It doesn't sort of mean arbitrary. Um, so if I were to draw, for example, uh, 999 random things out of the box, and I observed that this one that I was given was heavier than all of those 999 random samples, if this really was also a typical random element of the box, the probability of that happening would be just one in a thousand, because then these are all random elements of the box. So by drawing a random sample from the box, I can make a statistically rigorous statement about whether something I've been given is an outlier without actually looking in the box at all, just by drawing random samples out of it. This third way is a way of making a statistically rigorous outlier analysis without either looking at everything in the box or even having to draw random samples from the box in the precise way required for method two. Roughly speaking, the way this third way works is by doing a sensitivity analysis on the object that you've been given. So what we'll see this means in the case of maps is that we'll start from the enacted map that we're evaluating and we'll make small random changes to that map itself. And what we'll ask is, does making these small random changes to the enacted map have a consistent effect on the map? When I start making little changes to the boundary lines, does that consistently make the map less advantageous to Republicans? So it's a form of sensitivity analysis. And the point of this paper is showing how this kind of sensitivity analysis, which I think is intuitively very natural, is actually also completely statistically rigorously grounded in mathematics. So I think you mentioned that um, you applied this new third method of, uh, of outlier analysis to the problem of redistricting. Um, what made you um, decide to work on redistricting in particular? Uh, right, so when I first uh, was hired at Carnegie Mellon uh, a, a while ago now, uh, one of my co-authors, Alan Fries, and I uh, had some discussions about uh, the problem of analyzing districtings and the use of Markov chains for that purpose. So Markov chains are something that, uh, sort of, uh, they're a central topic in our field. And the particular districting question lended itself in a natural way to this kind of third way of analysis. And it was mathematically very interesting to us whether we could show in the absolute mathematical way uh, that, that we work that this kind of analysis would be completely rigorously grounded. Um, I see that out of three authors of this paper, you're what, you're, you are listed third. Does your placement on that list have any significance? No, so the convention in my field is that author names are always in alphabetical order. So I'm third in this list just because P, become, P comes after C and F. And if you looked at every paper I've ever published, you would find that's the case. And honestly, I would, I would recommend other fields do this also because it really simplifies things a lot. Um, have you written any other papers that use Markov chains to analyze redistricting? Uh, yes. Um, I'd like to pull up Plaintiff's Exhibit 511. What are we looking at here? So this is this paper that you just asked me about. The has, second. has this paper been published? No. Um, has it been vetted by the mathematical community? Yes, so despite the fact that this paper is not yet published, I have given talks uh, on the material in this paper. So for example, I talked at uh, the Duke Statistical and Applied Mathematical Sciences Institute and at Harvard's Center for Mathematical Sciences and Applications. And just to emphasize, for example, that at this talk at Harvard, I didn't just give the broad outlines of our ideas, but I went through in detail, line by line, presenting every aspect of our proof so that the experts in the audience could check for themselves that what we had done works. Um, I see that there's a date down at the bottom of this um, 
this first page here, April 8, 2019. What does that date indicate? Uh, that date is just the date that I uploaded this file to the archive preprint server. Archive is A-R-X-I-V. Um, and when did you begin working on this manuscript? Uh, more than a year ago. Um, and how does this paper differ from the previous paper we discussed? So this paper is still developing this idea of doing a third kind of outlier analysis. And, it's producing, and this paper simply develops new tools for that purpose. So it gives new theorems, which are also completely, absolutely mathematical correct, mathematically correct, uh, which uh, you can use when conducting this kind of third type of analysis. Um, have you ever testified in a court before? Yes, I testified in the League of Women Voters case in Pennsylvania. And very briefly, what testimony did you offer in that case? I offered testimony that the Congressional Districting of Pennsylvania was uh, a partisan gerrymander based on uh, applying the methods of that first paper that we discussed, the PNAS paper. Did the court in that case credit and rely on your testimony? Uh, yes, it did. Um, do you serve on any commissions related to redistricting? Yes. So the, the governor of Pennsylvania appointed me to the Redistricting Reform Commission in Pennsylvania, which is tasked with uh, studying the redistricting issue and considering possible reforms which the legislature could consider. Plaintiffs offer Dr. Peckton to testify as an expert in probability. Any objection? Um, no, Your Honor. His testimony will be received as proper. Thank you, Your Honor. Dr. Pegden, when did the plaintiff's attorneys first contact you about this case? Uh, I think somewhere around uh, the end of this year, sorry, sorry, the beginning of this year or the end of last year. So that was after the PNAS paper that we discussed first just a moment ago? Yes. And it was also after you started working on the unpublished manuscript that we discussed? Yes. And what were you asked to evaluate in this case? I was asked to evaluate whether the enacted House and Senate plans of North Carolina were drawn uh, with the intentional and extreme use of partisan considerations. Very briefly, without getting into the, the numbers just yet, um, what did you conclude? That they were. Um, and is the analysis that you performed to reach that conclusion um, related to the theorems we discussed in those two papers? Yes, as we'll see, for part of my analysis, I apply those theorems to make completely mathematically rigorous statistical statements about the uh, partisan uh, characteristics of the district teams. Um, let's pull up Plaintiff's Exhibit 508. What are we looking at here? This is the first page of my first report. Um, and let's pull up Plaintiff's Exhibit 551. What is this? This is the title page of my rebuttal report. Um, and is the analysis you are going to testify about today explained in greater detail in both of these two reports? Yes, it is. All right, can you give the court a very brief nutshell version of how your method of analysis works? Yes, so the term I used before was a sensitivity analysis. And really, that's a useful way to think about this. I'll start from the enacted map itself and make a sequence of small random changes to that map. And doing so will produce a sequence of comparison maps. And I'll evaluate the partisanship, the Republican advantage of the enacted map in each of those comparison maps. And the basic question that you ask is, is the enacted map more advantageous to the Republicans than the overwhelming majority of these comparison maps that you generated. And we'll see that it is. So for example, for the enacted, for both the House and Senate enacted maps, when I carry out the sequence of steps, the enacted map will be more advantageous to the Republican Party than more than 99.999% of the comparison maps that I generate. And just to emphasize, these comparison maps are not supposed to be neutral comparison maps drawn from scratch of North Carolina. Instead, these are comparison maps tied to the enacted map itself, which are drawn by making changes to the enacted map itself. And when we get to a discussion of how I implement the nonpartisan districting criteria, 
we'll see that these comparison maps are all strongly tied to the enacted map in various ways. So in particular, what we'll find is not just that the enacted map is an outlier uh, for the Republican Party against some set of neutral alternatives, but indeed, even against a set of extremely similar maps, which were generated from the enacted map, and which share all sorts of qualities with the enacted map, the enacted map is still uh, an extreme outlier with respect to how advantageous it is for the Republican Party. So if I understand it, you said you start with the enacted map. Actually, let me, let me back up. And let's, um, let's pull up Plaintiff's Exhibit 512, which is taken from page 9 of your initial report. Um, so if, as I understand it, um, you start with the enacted map, and then you, uh, you uh, select a, a geographic unit along the border between two districts. Uh, yes, that's right. So here we're looking at page 9 of my report. So this is the Senate districting of the Transylvania Henderson Buncombe uh, County cluster. And what you can see here is a one VTD change in this map. So one started with the enacted map on the left, randomly chose a VTD on the boundary of the two districts, and then made that change. Uh, so my method will work by making hundreds of billions or trillions of these changes to the districtings over and over again. And when you do, you check whether making this change complies with certain constraints? Absolutely. Um, and then you use historical voting data to evaluate the partisan characteristics of these maps that you create? Yes, exactly. Um, and then you said you repeat this billions or trillions of times? Yes. Um, and then once you've done one sequence of billions or trillions of steps, um, are you done or do you do that again? Uh, right, so one sequence of steps like that. So suppose that I start from this enacted map and then make changes to it over and over again to get this evolving sequence of comparison plans. One sequence of steps like that will be one run. And in my analyses, I do multiple runs for each analysis. So each run that I do starts from the enacted map and then makes a sequence of changes. And then you do uh, some, some mathematical analysis of the results of all of those runs. That's correct. Um, does any aspect of your method use the concept of proportional representation in any way? No. Um, and what maps did you analyze using this uh, method? I analyzed the enacted House and Senate maps of North Carolina, and I also did additional county cluster specific analyses for specific county clusters requested by plaintiff's counsel. All right, I, I understand that you have a video illustrating how your algorithm works. Um, let's pull up pegged and demonstrative D1. I, I believe it has been marked as plaintiff's exhibit uh, 900, if I have that right. Um, so before we start playing the video, what are we seeing in the first frame of the video here? So this is the enacted Senate map of the Franklin Wake County cluster. And this is for the Senate? Yes. Um, and what will we see when the, when the video starts playing? John, you can go ahead and start it. So what you see now, as the video starts, is random changes being made to this districting over and over again. And so these are all random changes that comply with the nonpartisan criteria as I implement them. Every one of the maps that you see in this video is then analyzed for how advantageous that map would be for Republicans. And the enacted map is then compared uh, to all of these comparison maps. Uh, this video, I should say, is running much, much slower than my algorithm. It's slowed down so that you can sort of see what's going on. And maybe one thing I would like to emphasize at this point while we see these comparison maps is that one theme that we'll, that we'll come to over and over again is that my goal in my analysis is not to compare the enacted maps to possible better maps of North Carolina that are sort of nicer or better looking or anything like that. So when I implement the nonpartisan criteria, we'll see that the, my implementation is tied in all sorts of ways to the choices the legislature made. So in that sense, it will really be an apples to apples comparison. And I understand we have a second video. John, can we pull that up? I believe this is plaintiff's exhibit, uh, pegged in demonstrative D2, which I believe has been marked as um, plaintiff's exhibit 901. You can go ahead and start it, John. Um, so this is Dr. the same thing, only going faster. So this video is running 
a hundred times slower still than the speed that my algorithm runs at. At this speed, to watch an entire run of comparison maps that my algorithm generates would take you roughly two months. And on the other hand, after the first half dozen frames of the video, the first fraction of a second, you would never again see a map, a single comparison map, as advantageous to the Republican Party as the enacted map itself. That is, for the Franklin Wake County clustering, a half dozen or so random changes is sufficient that already you've found a map which is less advantageous to the Republican Party and never again will you see one as bad as the map you started with. Even if we watched that video at that speed for two months and stayed awake the whole time. Exactly. Um, before we get into the details, the court has already heard a lot of testimony about algorithms and simulations. Um, can you explain for the court briefly how your analysis is different from that of Dr. Chen and Dr. Manningly? Yes, it's simply the difference between the second type of analysis and the third type of analysis. I'm not trying to draw random neutral plans to use as my baseline of comparisons. Instead, my analysis is a sensitivity analysis, this third way of this third method of analysis that uh, compares the enacted plan to other perturbations of the enacted map itself. All right, let's, at this point, let's start delving into some of the details of your method. Now, if I recall, you said you start with the enacted map, and the first thing you do is you choose a geographic unit at random on the, the border of the boundary line between two, dist two districts. Do I have that right? Yes. Um, and what geographic unit do you use? I use two units in this report, uh, VTDs, which we've heard a lot about, and geo units, that's GEO units. Um, when do you use VTDs? I use VTDs essentially anytime I can. So for example, the enacted Senate map Splits, uh, splits relatively few VTDs, and so I do all of my Senate map analyses at the VTD level. The enacted House map, on the other hand, splits almost 50 VTDs. So to enable my method to use good comparisons to the enacted map, I also want my comparison maps to be able to split VTDs, um, and so I use a sub-VTD unit, which is what's called a geo unit in my report. And what is a geo unit? A geo unit is simply a reasonably compact collection of census blocks which is below the VTD level. So it's a group of census blocks uh, which respect precinct lines, that is VTD lines, district lines, and have, uh, let's say, on the order of 500 to 1,000 people in them. So on average, each VTD is composed of maybe six or seven of these geo units. And how are these geo units created? These are just made using a computer uh, which agglomerates census blocks based purely on geographical information. So in particular, you want a combination of census blocks which is re reasonably compact and does not cross VTD and district lines. All right, so after you select a geographic unit on a boundary line, either a VTD or, or a geo unit, uh, if I understand you correctly, you try swapping that geographic unit from one district into the neighboring district. Do I have that right? Yes, exactly. And then you check if the resulting map complies with certain nonpartisan constraints. Yes. Um, what is the general purpose of those constraints? The purpose of those constraints is to ensure that the comparison maps we're using for our comparison are good, reasonable comparisons to the enacted map. Um, let's pull up your initial report, which is Plaintiff's Exhibit 508. Um, and let's go to page seven, and if we can look at um, section 4.3.1 at the bottom of the page. Um, is this the beginning of that, uh, or I guess all of that list of uh, constraints you were just talking about? Yeah, so beginning on page seven, running into page eight, we see the list of districting criteria that I imposed. And let's, let's walk through these. Um, we can do the first one pretty quickly, I imagine. Uh, contiguity, how does your algorithm apply that constraint? So quite simply, if the algorithm considers making a swap, which would result in one of the districts becoming discontiguous, it does not make the swap. Um, I see population deviation is next on the list. Um, how does your algorithm apply that constraint? Uh, right, so you can see here that it says that I require comparison districtings to have 
populations, district populations, within the same range as the enacted House and Senate plans. Um, so recall that the enacted House and Senate plans are subject to a legal requirement of plus minus 5% population deviation from ideal. Uh, now in actual fact, uh, the population range of the enacted House plan, for example, goes up to plus 5% from ideal, but on the bottom end, goes down to around 4.97% below ideal. So it doesn't quite use the whole range that it could have. And my method requires my comparison maps not just to be within the minus 5 to plus 5 range, the legal requirement, but even the stronger requirement of being between minus 4.97% and plus 5%. That is, I always require the comparison plans for the House and Senate maps to be within the same range used by the enacted map. So the theme here, which we'll see coming up in all these criteria, is that I, I accept choices that the map makers made themselves and require my comparison maps to meet those same constraints. Um, I see next on the list here is compact districts. How does your um, algorithm apply that constraint? Yes, so my algorithm calculates the poles B popper score for each district and then obtains a districting wide compactness score by taking the reciprocal average of the district scores. And then all of my comparison districtings are required to be at least as compact in this measure as the enacted plan up to an error of 5%. Um, did you check to see whether using a different measure of compactness might affect your results? Yes, so in Appendix C, I believe it is in my report, I conducted additional runs with uh, other ways of constraining compactness. For example, I changed this 5% error threshold to 10% or 0%. And I also conducted runs where I used a completely different compactness metric based just on taking the total perimeter of all the districts. Right? This is one way you could measure the compactness of a districting, simply sum the perimeters of every district. And uh, I also carried out runs with that completely different metric. And did using these different compactness measures materially affect your conclusions? No, it didn't. In fact, when I did this, I found something quite striking that was very surprising even to me, which is that for some of these changes, there was no effect at all. So for example, it's changing from using uh, the Polby popper score to using the perimeter metric, it's completely different compactness metric, didn't change the results one bit. And the reason is that when you make the sequence of random changes to the enacted map, like we saw with Franklin Wake, after a handful of changes, sometimes after one change, the map is already less advantageous to Republicans and never again as bad as the enacted map. And so what this shows is that the finding is extremely insensitive to how you measure compactness. Almost anything that you did there would give you exactly the same answer. I see that the next item on the list here is county preservation. How does your algorithm apply that constraint? So there are three types of county constraints. First, obviously, is the North Carolina county clustering. So my district names all have to respect the North Carolina county clustering. Second. Uh, I require that any county which is uh, preserved whole by the enacted map is preserved whole in my comparison maps, in all of them. And notice, this is another example of a requirement more strict than uh, would be necessary. Sometimes there might be discretion about which counties should be kept whole. Do I keep this county whole or that county whole? I accept the choice that the map makers made and I require all of my comparison maps to satisfy that same choice. Finally, I constrain the number of county traversals to ensure that the number of county traversals in my comparison plans does not exceed the number of county traversals in the enacted plan. Um, I see that next on the list is municipality preservation. How does your algorithm apply that constraint? So this is another constraint that I apply very conservatively. For any municipality, which is preserved whole by the enacted plan, not only do I require that municipality be preserved whole in all of my comparison plans, 
but it will also actually be preserved whole in exactly the same district it belonged to before. So for example, if District 11 and the enacted plan contains wholly towns A, B, and C, then towns A, B, and C will be preserved in all my comparison plans and still in District 11. Um, when you say you preserve municipalities, do you mean just big cities like Charlotte and Raleigh? No, this is all municipalities in the data set provided by the legislature. So I think it's half a thousand or so. And um, does this constraint bias your results in one way or the other? Absolutely. Like my other conservative application of the criteria, this ties my comparisons very strongly to the enacted plan itself. The fact that the enacted plan is an outlier with respect to partisanship against even such close comparison maps that share all these properties with it are that is that much more remarkable. Um, I see that next on the list is um, precinct preservation. How does your algorithm apply that constraint? Right, so in the house where I allow precinct splits, I require that the number of precincts split by my algorithm not exceed the number in the enacted plan. And here, I apologize, precinct is being used as a synonym for VTD. All right, and last on this list, I see we have incumbency protection. How does your algorithm apply that constraint? So any incumbent unpaired in the enacted map is required to be unpaired in all comparison maps. So exactly the same set of unpaired incumbents. Um, beyond not pairing incumbents, are you familiar with another concept of incumbency protection, sometimes known as core retention? Beyond not pairing incumbents, are you familiar with another concept of incumbency protection known as core retention? Uh, yes. So uh, this is usually an imprecise but general idea that when preserving incumbents, one could try to preserve sort of the a core constituency of the incumbent when drawing districts. And uh, right. So. Yes, that's how I understand it. And does, um, does your uh, method attempt to uh, preserve the core of districts? So that's not a design goal of my method. However, the conservative way in which I implement my other criteria does result in this effect. So for example, suppose that uh, there's an unpaired incumbent in the enacted map who lives in District 11 with towns A, B, and C. In every single one of my comparison maps, that incumbent will live in District 11, and District 11 will contain towns A, B, and C. Every North Carolina municipality wholly contained in the unpaired incumbent's district will belong to their district in every comparison map. Now, when developing this list of nonpartisan constraints, did you consult the um, 2017 enacted criteria? Yes. Um, and do you, um, do you recall that some questions were put to Dr. Mattingly on cross-examination on Friday about whether his analysis accounted for other um, purportedly nonpartisan criteria that were not part of the 2017 enacted criteria? Yes. Um, for example, he was asked about whether his analysis preserved communities of interest. Do you remember that? I do. Um, and preserving communities of interest is not listed on the 2017 enacted criteria. Is that right? Unless what you mean by communities of interest is, for example, counties and municipalities. Um, and are you aware of any statements by legislative defendants in this case about whether the 2017 enacted criteria are in fact the only criteria that were considered in the drawing of the enacted maps? Yes, I am. I'd like to pull up Plaintiff's Exhibit 584. And I'll represent to you based on the, the, that the title of this document will show that it's um, de legislative defendants uh, responses to plaintiff's interrogatories in this case. And I'd like to p turn to page 14. I'd like you to just read the question at the top and the response uh, just going through the words plaintiff's counsel. So the question was, identify and describe all criteria that were considered or used in drawing or revising district boundaries for the 2017 plans. And the response was, the criteria used to draw the 2017 plans is the criteria adopted by the redistricting committees, is a matter of public record, and has already been provided to plaintiff's counsel. Um, does this statement confirm to you that the list of constraints you imposed in your algorithm based on the 2017 enacted criteria is an appropriate list? 
Yes. All right, let's go back to the constraints you impose in your algorithm. How do you deal with the uh, districts that were redrawn by the special master in 2017? I was provided by a list of special master districts by plaintiff's counsel, which were not allowed to change in my analysis. And is the effect of freezing those districts to freeze all of the boundaries that the special master redrew in 2017? Yes, a good way to think about this is, suppose I have two districts, A and B. If the boundary between them was not changed by the special master, then that boundary will not change in any of my comparison maps. And if the boundary, uh, I, uh, I see oh, you looking, did I? I think, I think you may have misspoke, why don't you say that? Okay, <laughs> let, me, let me say it again. Uh, if the boundary between districts A and B was not changed by the special master, then my algorithm will allow changes to this boundary. My apologies. And of course, if this boundary was changed by the special master, then my algorithm will not make changes to it. All right, in that constraint, along with all the other constraints we just discussed, seems like a lot of constraints. Does it, so does it ever happen that um, your, uh, when you try to make one of these swaps, it just isn't possible to find one that meets all of these constraints? Yeah, a simple way that you can imagine this happening is if I have a two district county cluster, both of whose districts are very close to the lower population threshold, okay? So what could happen in the situation is that if I move a VTD from one side to the other, whichever side would lose the VTD would end up with a district population which is too small. So it could be the case that simply no swaps are possible. So what do you do in that circumstance? Well, in this situation, you could imagine that it might be possible to make, for example, an exchange of VTDs from one side to the other. So when I can't produce uh, comparison maps with single move swaps, I uh, allow an extension of my algorithm which tries to make multiple moves in one step. So for example, can we find five VTD changes uh, after which the uh, criteria are still satisfied. So it simply allows you to make more than one change at once. Why don't you just run all of your analysis with these multi-move swaps? The only reason is that it's computationally more intensive. So it would take a lot longer? Yes. Um, does it ever happen that even with multi-move swaps, there still aren't any swaps that um, satisfy all your constraints or only a very small number? Yes, it's still possible that because I've implemented the nonpartisan criteria so conservatively and tied my comparison map so strongly to the enacted plan, it could happen that simply no comparison maps can be generated at all for a given cluster. And what does that mean for your, for your analysis when that happens? Uh, well, it means that I just can't say anything about the situation. I have literally no comparison to make. If I've if I'm not able to generate any comparison maps, the only map I know of of this cluster is the enacted map. And I, it's the worst of that one map that I know of, but I feel like that's not, uh, it's nothing useful to say. So I, I think you've already made this clear, but just to, just to, to tie it off. Um, so if you, if you don't have any comparison maps, does that mean that that particular cluster was, um, uh, did not make extreme and intentional use of partisan considerations? No, for example, uh, it's quite possible that Parson considerations were the predominant factor in choosing which towns to put in which districts, which is a question that my uh, analysis, because of how conservatively I've applied it, wouldn't be able to answer. All right, so let's move to the next uh, step in your, your analysis. You, after you swap a, a VTD or a geo unit from one district into another, I believe you said that the next thing your algorithm does is use historical voting data to evaluate the partisan characteristics of the resulting map. Is that right? Yes. Um, for your main analysis, what historical voting data do you use? I use the 2016 attorney general race and the 2008 commissioner of insurance race. And in what circumstances, G? Commissioner of insurance race. And in what circumstances do you, do, do you use the 2016 Attorney General race? And in what circumstances do you use the 2008 Commissioner of Insurance election? So I use the 2016 race anytime I'm analyzing a whole map or when I'm analyzing a set of districts which were updated in the 2017 redistricting process. I use the 2008 Commissioner of Insurance race only when I'm analyzing a set of districts which were last changed in 2011 and then not updated 
in the 2017 districting. Um, how did you choose these particular elections to use? <clears throat> so these elections were chosen simply be, because they are statewide, reasonably close, down ballot elections, which were available to the legislature at the time of drawing. And that last point is very important to me because my, the point of my analysis is really to get at the intent of the legislature when drawing these maps. I want to understand the decisions they made with the information available to them at the time. Did you check to see whether using different elections might affect your results? Yes, yeah, so I also did completely different analyses or, or analyses using completely different voting data, rather, in the robustness check section of my report. I used four additional elections. Uh, we don't need to go through those now, but they're listed in your report? Yes. Um, and did using those different elections materially change your conclusions? No. Um, let's pause here for a second. You, you've mentioned twice now the concept of a robustness check. Um, you mentioned it here, and then I think you mentioned it when we were discussing your compactness measure. Can you explain in general terms what, the, what a robustness check is? Yes, yeah, so I've made various decisions about how to implement things like compactness and partisan data in my report. And I've drawn on my expertise in analyzing districtings to make those decisions, and I think they were excellent decisions to make for this report. The point of the robustness check section is to show you an interesting fact, which is that actually you could have made completely different decisions about how to do those, uh, how to implement those criteria, and reached exactly the same conclusion. So sort of no matter how you approach those things in a reasonable way, you would arrive at the same answer. All right, so we've now gone through the, the voting data that you use. You said you use that data to evaluate the partisan characteristics of the alternative maps. Um, in your main analysis, what metric do you use to evaluate the partisan characteristics of all of these maps? So uh, the metric I use is the average number of uh, seats the Republican Party would win with a given map in an election which is a random uniform swing away from the voting data being used. So that's, uh, there was a lot there, but I think you're gonna take me through it. Yes, let's, let's, let's go through that piece by piece. Um, uh, let's uh, pull up pegged and demonstrative D3. So this is just a, a very simple, this demonstrative appears to me as showing a very simple hypothetical two district cluster, is that right? Yes, this does not appear in North Carolina. Um, and then in this, in this hypothetical cluster in the 2016 AG race, the Republican candidate got 35% of the vote, and in District B, the Republican candidate got 51% of the vote. Do I have that right? Yes. Okay, so the court has heard, already heard a lot of testimony about uniform swings, but can you just very quickly refresh our memories about what a uniform swing would look like in this hypothetical two district cluster? Right, so for example, suppose that I apply a plus 3% uniform swing to the Republican vote share, then in the left district, the Republicans would have 38% of the vote. In the right district, District B, they would have 54%. They would still be winning one seat. If I applied a minus 3% to the Republican vote share, then they would have 32% in District A, 48% in District B, and they would be winning zero seats. All right, so that is a those are examples of uniform swings. Yes. I believe you said that your metric uses a random uniform swing. Can you explain what that is? Yes, so my metric asked the question, for this cluster, if I apply a random uniform swing to this cluster, on average, how many seats do the Republicans win? Right, so for, and for example, notice that uh, we should expect them to essentially never win District A because they would take a 15% uniform swing. So the, reason, the question here is, are they going to win one seat or zero seats in this cluster when I apply a random uniform swing? So any uniform swing which is positive for the Republicans is going to give them their one seat in District B. When the uniform swing loses them more than one percentage point, they'll end up winning zero seats. And my metric for this cluster is simply when I draw the uniform swing randomly, it's drawn from a normal distribution, the details are in my report, on average how many seats would they win? 
So for this cluster, the answer would be something like 0.7 or 0.8 or something. It's going to be on average how many seats they would win with that random uniform swing. Um, so in layman's terms, is it fair to say that your metric captures how this cluster uh, performs over a range of electoral environments that are centered around here, the 2016 attorney general race? Yes, exactly. Um, did you perform a robustness check to see if using some other metric for evaluating partisanship might affect your results? Yes. So uh, one theme that we've heard from some other witnesses in this case is the idea that the a districting was built with these walls, a wall at the supermajority, a wall at the Republican majority. And in my uh, appendix, I applied another partisan metric based on testing whether there's a wall at the majority for the Republicans. And that metric is actually very simple. Uh, it simply ranks the districts from most Republican to least Republican. And then, for example, for the House, asks what is the Republican vote share in the 61st district in that list? Because you, as you can imagine, if you're trying to design a districting to maximize the chance that the Republicans keep a majority in the 120 seat House against a large Democratic wave, the salient question is how easy it is to win that 61st seat. So I conducted a completely different analysis in my, uh, or again, an analysis using this completely different metric in the robustness check section of my report. Just so we're clear, is it fair to say this metric, this alternative metric, ca uh, captures how comfortably Republicans would win the seat that gives them a majority in the chamber in question? Yes, exactly. Um, and in your rebuttal report, did you run yet another partisanship metric? Yeah, so in my rebuttal report, in response, to, uh, in response to some of the defendants' experts, I demonstrated that despite the fact that these two metrics I used are excellent choices for a variety of reasons, one could have done my analysis and just used seats as the metric. That is, just take the historical voting data, count up Democratic districts, and use that as your metric, and then applied my methodology and applied my theorems and you would have found the same thing. So just to be clear, when you, when you talk about just using seats, how would that metric work in this hypothetical two district cluster? In this cluster, the Republicans have one seat. And did using any of these different partisanship metrics um, materially affect your conclusions? No, in fact, they reinforced uh, the point for me that any way you did this analysis, you reached the same conclusion. All right, so once you evaluate the partisan but, characteristics. But we're going to break for 10 minutes, and then we'll pick up where, where you are now. Uh, so we'll resume at 11.05. Uh, <laughs>
Dr. Duke. Thank you, Your Honors. So, Dr. Pegden, um, before we uh, took a break, you were telling us about how you evaluate the partisan characteristics of the resulting map. Um, and I believe you testified earlier that you repeat all of the steps that led up to that billions or trillions of times. I have that right? Yes. And how, how do you decide how many times to repeat? Uh, I mean, I like uh, to have extremely, to be able to communicate uh, just how extreme the map is. So I'd like to be able to show these 99.999% numbers. But at the same time, it's important to me that it's possible to reproduce all the analysis in my report in not more than a few days. So the runs were chosen simply to, so that I could make clear how dramatically uh, the plans are optimized for Republican advantage while still being able to be carried out in a reasonable amount of computation time. Um, in a reasonable amount of computation time. Um, and I believe you said that um, for each sequence of however many billions of steps, that, that's one run, right? Yes. And then you do multiple runs. Yes. How do you decide how many runs to do? Uh, again, so doing more runs would allow you uh, to assert even greater statistical significance for the results. But at some point, enough is enough. And you want to you want it to be able to run a reasonable amount of time. Um, I think you've testified about this already, but I would just want to um, make sure, make clear all these billions of maps that your algorithm generates, are they intended to provide some sort of baseline for what a neutral, nonpartisan map should look like? Absolutely not. I would not recommend that anybody enact these maps, right? These maps were all made by making small random changes to the enacted map itself and baked in all sorts of choices that the legislature made when drawing the maps. All right, so and then after you've done all however many runs you're doing, um, you do some mathematical analysis on the results, is that right? That's correct. All right, let, let's pull up an example to see how those results work. Um, can we pull up plaintiff's exhibit 524, which is taken from page 17 of your uh, report? Yes. All right, what, what are we looking at here? So this is the cluster specific analysis for the Brunswick New Hanover cluster. Um, yes. Um, so just to get us oriented, what are, what are these four maps we're looking at across the top? Right, so the leftmost map here is the enacted map of the House Districting of this cluster. And the next three maps are representative examples of comparison maps generated by my algorithm. Right, so these comparison maps are output every 40 billion maps or so. They're output at some regular interval and not carefully chosen by me. And uh, sorry, go ahead. Can I just say, when you look at the comparisons, uh, at first you might think just the same map was shown four times. But the maps are different. But the point is that, again, because of my conservative application of the criteria, <coughs> the comparison maps here are tightly tied to the enacted plan, which will make the results that we discuss next all the more remarkable. All right, I see that below these four maps, there is then a table. Can you explain what is presented in that table? Yes. So I did 32 runs for this analysis. Each run was roughly 140 billion steps. And this table just shows the result for each run. So for example, we see that for run one, 99.978% of the comparison maps generated were less advantageous to the Republican Party than the enacted map itself. And then you report similar figures for each of the 32 runs. That's what's going down each, each level in this table? Yes, there's 32 uh, runs here, each with a number, and they all mean exactly that same thing. All right, and then below the table, I see there are three bullet points. The first bullet point seems to be just describing the number of runs and the number of steps in each run. Yes. Um, uh, below that, there's a, there's a bullet point that says first level analysis. Can you explain what your first level analysis is? Right, so for the first level analysis, I'm not applying any fancy math at all. At all. I'm simply looking at the results of my algorithm, which made small random changes while preserving the nonpartisan criteria, and reporting what happened. So in the first level analysis, I simply report that in every one of those 32 times I made a sequence of random changes, the enacted map was more favorable to Republicans than 
of the comparison maps. So that's true in every single run. So the first level analysis, again, it's simply a report of what happened. And you can see this dramatic finding that any, every single time I did this, the overwhelming majority of the comparison plans, which themselves, with respect to their nonpartisan criteria, are very similar to the enacted map, were less advantageous to the Republican Party than the enacted map. Um, does this first level analysis without any fancy math applied as of yet tell us anything about um, this, uh, the, the map of this cluster? Yes, it shows you that the boundary lines of this district <coughs> map are extremely carefully placed to optimize Republican advantage. That even if I accept all these various choices that the map makers made that I implemented in my criteria, still, once I start changing the rest of the boundary lines, even slightly, I find that the Republican par partisan advantage consistently evaporates. And I mean, so one way I like to think about this sometimes, it's almost like I can hear a voice of the, of the map maker telling me, no, don't change those lines. They're exactly where I want them. And as soon as you start making these changes, this Republican advantage starts to disappear. Um, could this result that you uh, report for your first level analysis be explained by this cluster's particular political geography? No, it really couldn't because the very nature of the analysis is that it's an apples to apples comparison. Every one of these trillions of comparison districts that I use is a map of the same cluster with the same political geography and I analyze them all using the same voting data. So neither the political geography nor the, nor the choice of the voting data could be responsible for the sense in which the enacted map is this extreme outlier. I see that the, the bottom uh, bullet point here says second level analysis. Can you explain what your second level analysis is? Yeah, so this is where I apply the mathematical theorems uh, that I developed with my co-authors in those papers. And the second, the second level analysis for this cluster tells you that the enacted Brunswick New Hanover cluster districting is among the most carefully crafted districtings for Republican advantage. In particular, it's among the most carefully crafted 0.09% of all alternative districtings of the Brunswick New Hanover cluster satisfying my districting criteria. And so the striking thing to emphasize about the second level analysis is that this is not just a statement about how the map compares to the maps that my algorithm generated, but to all maps that you could even in theory draw of this cluster while respecting the nonpartisan criteria that I did. All right, let's unpack that a little bit. If I understand correctly, there are two basic differences between your first level analysis and your second level analysis. The first difference is what the comparison set is. Is that right? Yes, the second level analysis, and I, I aim to convince you that you should not be surprised, but at first this is surprising, is really the set of all possible districtings that you could draw for the cluster that respect your, your uh, monopartisan constraints? Exactly. All right, and then the second difference, if I understand it, is that your first level analysis is comparing the enacted map to the other maps based on how advantageous they are to Republicans, whereas your second level analysis is making that comparison based on how carefully crafted the map is. Do I have that right? Exactly. You can see here the comparison is that it's in the most carefully crafted of districtings for Republican advantage. What does it mean for a districting to be carefully crafted? So the measure of how carefully crafted a districting is that I employ in my report is how sensitive the boundary lines are to small changes. So uh, it is literally the probability that if I start making small random changes to the boundary lines of the districting, the Republican partisan advantage consistently decreases. That is the measure of how carefully crafted the districting is. In layman's terms, is it fair to say that a map is more carefully crafted the more precisely the district boundaries line up with partisan voting patterns so as to advantage Republicans? Yes. Um, so can you remind me one more time your conclusion for this, your second level analysis for this uh, cluster? Yes, it's among the most carefully crafted 00.09% of all alternative districtings satisfying my criteria. So if you were to take a map at random from the set of all possible maps of this cluster satisfying your criteria, and you were to take, you were to take a map at random 10,000 times, how many times 
would you pick a map that is as carefully crafted for, for Republican partisan advantage as the enacted map? You would expect it to happen about nine times because nine in 10,000 is this number of 0.09%. Um, how confident are you in that conclusion? So uh, this second level analysis and all the second level analyses in my report are statistically rigorous statements accompanied by p-values. So the p-value attached to all of my cluster specific analyses is p equals 0 0.002. That's a level of statistical significance. My statewide analyses are subject to an either, even stricter uh, level of statistical significance of 0 0.0 statistical significance of 0 0.0002. Uh, just for comparison, the FDA routinely accepts drug trials at a significance level of 0 0.05, which is a much weaker threshold for statistical significance. And if you wanted, you could also do my report again with even crazier levels of statistical significance. You would just have to do more runs. Um, now, your second level analysis makes some, some striking claims about comparing the enacted map to all possible maps of this cluster that, that satisfy your criteria. Um, but if I understand it, your algorithm doesn't look at all possible maps of this, of this cluster, is that right? That's right, that would be method one. Um, and you don't try to take a random sample of all possible maps of this cluster, is that right? That would be method two. Um, so how are you able to make rigorous statistical claims about how the, how the uh, enacted map is an outlier with respect to all possible maps of this cluster? Yeah, so it, it really is surprising the first time you hear it. Uh, the way I should start this answer is by saying these conclusions are made by directly applying our mathematical theorems, which are absolutely true in the sense that they have proofs, they have been checked, they're not somehow subject to debate or difference of opinion, they're sort of absolutely true. Uh, but nevertheless, I feel like uh, I want to give some intuition for actually why it makes sense that you can make this kind of comparison. You don't just have to rely on a theorem that it's proved that you don't understand. Uh, so the, to do this, I like to give an analogy. Um, the analogy involves showing up in a new city that you've never been to and getting a bite to eat. Okay? So you land at the airport in this new city, and uh, you've never been in the city before. You don't know anything about it. Okay? In particular, you don't know what the restaurants are like. Are they good? Are they bad? How many of them they are, there are? You have no idea. And what you're interested in is eating at a typical restaurant. So you go to the taxi stand, you get in the taxi, and you tell the cabbie, take me to a typical random restaurant, and I'll give you a nice big tip. Okay? Now suppose he says, yes, here we go. He drops you off. You give him your tip. You go in, and it's the worst food you've ever eaten. It's just an awful meal. Your first reaction, quite naturally, might be to be upset, right? Because he took you here and the food is bad. But really, your second reaction should be that, well, actually, maybe he did what I asked. I don't know anything about this city. Maybe restaurants here are just bad, okay? And before I continue, let me just emphasize in this analogy, so the taxi driver here is like the map maker. The restaurants are the maps, and he's dropped us off at a restaurant, as in he's drawn a map for us from the set of possibilities. And we've decided it's bad. And we're trying to figure out whether it's really fair to be upset at this taxi driver. Like, did he really do this on purpose? And at first, it seems like if I don't have a catalog of all the restaurants, if I haven't looked at all of them, I can't really know for sure whether he did this on purpose or not. But suppose I do the following experiment, which is exactly analogous to what I do in my report. I start to wander around the restaurant where he dropped me off. And I notice that not only did he take me to a terrible restaurant, but I'm at a terrible restaurant in a sea of terrific five-star restaurants where I would have been thrilled to eat. Right? All around me are these great restaurants, and he didn't take me there. So what I put to you is that actually this is enough to be mad at the taxi driver. Because while it is true in principle that there could be cities where a typical restaurant is bad, it's not true even in principle for there to be a city where a typical restaurant is a bad restaurant surrounded by good restaurants. And so as a math professor, I really like giving people homework. And I don't really expect you to do it. But the homework I would like you to attempt <laughs> is to design such a city. Right? Take out a piece of paper. And you can use green dots for bad restaurants and yellow dots for good restaurants. And try to make a city where most dots are green surrounded by yellow dots. 
And it's just not possible because each time you make one of these clusters, each time you put down your bad restaurant surrounded by good restaurants, you have all these good restaurants now in your map. And exactly the same thing is happening with the districting. So in districtings, the bad restaurants are the maps with, that are advantageous to Republicans. And what we find is that these maps that were drawn that are advantageous to Republicans are not only advantageous to Republicans, but are surrounded in this space of maps by the sea of fairer maps which could have been drawn. And that is enough to know, without looking at all the possibilities, that this was done on purpose. To your knowledge, have any of the experts retained by the legislative defendants or intervener defendants in this case questioned the mathematical validity of the theorems that underlie um, that example in any way? No, in fact, nobody has ever done so. All right, let's go through the results of your analysis. Um, we'll start with your statewide analysis. Um, and I understand that you've run your statewide analysis three times each for the House and the Senate. Um, can you explain what you did each of those three times? Yes, so I, can st I conducted one analysis of the whole state uh, using 2016 voting data. One analysis where I only allowed changes to districts which were updated in the 2017 process, again using 2016 voting data. And one analysis where I only allowed changes to districts which were last changed in 2011, then using 2008 voting data. And what's the basic purpose of these three different analyses? Well, the first analysis is just to analyze the map as a whole. I think that doesn't really require an explanation. The purpose of the other two analyses was to answer a question that was interesting to me, which was whether, for example, it was possible that gerrymandering only occurred in the 2011 process or only in the 2017 process. Because one, one unusual and uh, when you're doing analysis, potentially frustrating thing about this map is it includes these districts from uh, two different processes. So I wanted to understand whether one of these processes could be solely responsible for what was going on in this map. And as we'll see, I found out that that's not the case. Both collections of districts are extremely carefully crafted to optimize Republican partisan advantage. All right, let's, let's start going through your House results. And let's yes. start by pulling up Plaintiff's Exhibit 514, which is taken from page 12 of your initial report. What do we see here? Uh, right, so the first thing you see is the comparison maps. Again, the top left is the enacted map. Looking at the whole state here, I don't really expect you to see much about what's going on. For the clusters, it's easier to really look at these maps. But the, the other three maps are just other maps generated by your algorithm at regular intervals? Yes, they're representative examples, not carefully chosen. Um, let's go to Plaintiff's Exhibit 515, which is taken from the same page of your initial report. Yes. What are we looking at here? This is the result of my analysis of the whole state. And again, the voting data I used for this was the 2016 Attorney General. And what, did you what did you conclude about um, this analysis of the whole state using 2016 voting data. So here you can see I did 16 runs, and you can see I report in my first level analysis that in every single run, 99.99984% uh, or more of comparison maps were less advantageous to Republicans. And uh, in the second level analysis, I apply my theorems and show that this means that the enacted House districting is among the most carefully crafted for Republican partisan advantage 0.0009%. That means that point, uh, I'm sorry, 99.9991% of all alternative maps that you could draw respecting the districting criteria would be less carefully crafted for Republican advantage than the enacted map itself. Uh, let's go to uh, Plaintiff's Exhibit 516. What are we seeing here? This is exactly the same thing, only now this is the analysis just of the 2017 districts. So no changes were allowed to districts last changed in 2011 for this analysis. You can see that nevertheless, even on the smaller set of districts last changed in 2017, the analysis has found that 99.9982% of comparison districts or more were less advantageous to Republicans in every single run. And in the second level analysis, applying the theorems, this means uh, that 99.99% of comparison map, of all alternative districtings respecting the district criteria are uh, less carefully crafted for Republican partisan advantage. 
And we'll net move now to Plaintiff's Exhibit 517, taken from page 13 of your report. Yes. What do we see here? Uh, the same thing, but now we're analyzing just the 2011 districts. The first level analysis found that in every single run, 99.9999 nine nine eight eight percent I think I counted the ninth correctly were less advantageous to Republicans in every run in the second level of analysis this means that ninety nine point nine 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 percent of all alternative maps respecting the criteria are less carefully crafted for Republican advantage than the enacted plan and uh, let me just r remind us since we're looking at these things by themselves that as described in my report, the second level analyses are all, are all statistically rigorous statements accompanied by p-values. And as we said earlier, those p-values accompanied by p-values. And those p-values for all the whole state analyses are p equals 0 0.0002 and for the cluster analyses 0 0.002. All right, let's move now to the Senate side. Um, let's pull up uh, Francis Exhibit 518. Very quickly, what are these maps here? The same thing, but for the Senate. All right, and we can move quickly on to Plaintiff's Exhibit 519. I think this should be, we should be able to move quickly at this point, but what are we seeing here? So um, you see basically the same results, broadly the same types of findings, but for the Senate. Uh, do you want me to read the numbers for the first and second level analysis? I can do it quickly. Let's go, uh, yes, let's, let's get that in the record, uh, just to be clear. Okay, so in the first level analysis, this is of the whole state, 99 point, uh, sorry, I'm gonna count the nines on my paper. 99.999999% were less partisan in every single run. In the second level analysis, 99.99999, uh, sorry, I have to start over, I'm sorry. 99.99999 percent. I'm so sorry for you having to transcribe this. <laughs> Hopefully there are buttons just for nines. Um, and uh, or less carefully crafted for Republican advantage. All right, and now plaintiff's, plaintiff's Exhibit 520. Yes. So this is the same thing but for 2011 districts and in the first level now. Did you say 2011 districts? Oh, sorry. Or we just did the second one. Sorry. This is 2017 districts. Um, and your first level analysis, that number is? 99.99999% uh, And for your second level analysis? 99.9999985% All right, last one, Plaintiff's Exhibit 521, taken from page 15 of your report. I know it's a little tedious, but just for, so the record's clear, one more time for your first level analysis. 99.9995. And for your second level analysis? 99.997. And just to be clear, this is the uh, 2011 districts that were not changed in 2017? Uh, that's correct. Okay. Um, so let's at this point pull up pegged to demonstrative uh, D4. I think this has been marked as plaintiff exhibit 904. So what is this? This is just a summary demonstrative showing the results of those first and second level analyses for these uh, whole state and, uh, and partial state analyses. So I, I won't ask you to read them again. They're all, they're all in the record. Thank you. Um, I, I do want to have one point of clarification. Um, John, if we could highlight the um, second level analysis for the whole state for the House and for the Senate. So that's that one and the one down there. So I, looking at these two numbers, it looks like the number for the Senate is ever so slightly larger than the number for the House. There are a few extra nines for the Senate. Um, does that mean um, that the, the House is in some way less gerrymandered or made less extreme and intentional use of partisan considerations than the Senate? No, it really doesn't. So. Uh, these theor first of all, these theorems that I apply are really one directional. They allow you to conclude that something is extremely carefully crafted. They don't allow you to put an upper limit on how carefully crafted it is. Uh, and right, so maybe let me just leave it at that. So these numbers, you can't compare and <coughs> read into which one is bigger. I can tell you that the whole state is, it, is 
at least it has this problem that's in the 99.99, that 99.999% would be better than it. It's possible that even a larger fraction would be better than it. So I don't put any upper bound on these numbers with my theorems, only lower bounds. All right, let's move now to your cluster by cluster analysis. Um, and but, but before we go through your results, just to be clear, what election data do you use for each of your cluster by cluster analysis? So when analyzing a cluster where the districts were last changed in 2017, I used the two, 2016 attorney general race. And when analyzing an election, uh, a cluster with districts last changed in 2011, I used the 2008 commissioner returns race. All right, let's go through just two examples here. Um, yes. Let's pull up Plaintiff's Exhibit 533, taken from page 23 of your report. What are we looking at here? This is the page 23 of his report. This is the enacted, this is my analysis of the enacted house districting of Wake County. Um, and can you, uh, we'll, we'll summarize all of your, your um, uh, results for this, um, for this and the other clusters later, so you don't need to read the numbers in. Um, but uh, I, we can, I think we can all see that there are a lot of nines there. Um, yes. can, um, I just want to have a few clarifications about this cluster in particular. Um, just to be clear, are you aware that the House districts in Wake County recently were redrawn within the last month or so? Yes. Um, which version of the House districts in Wake County did you analyze for this case? Uh, those before the redrawing, which were in place when I did the analysis. So have you done any analysis of the, the now in place districts in Wake County, the ones that were recently redrawn? No. All right. Uh, Let's look at one more example. Can we pull up? Actually, and can I just point something out Please. about this? So just one thing I want us to notice while I have, when you see these uh, comparison figures, so I, I pointed out earlier how the way I implement the criteria tie the comparison maps to the enacted map in all sorts of ways, in the threshold for compactness municipalities, et cetera. Oh, and the for compactness, municipality preservation, et cetera. And so one thing that I hope comes across in these comparison maps is that they look like reasonable comparisons. They have the weird features that the enacted map has when it has weird features. When it doesn't have weird features, then the comparison maps don't. It, it looks like a good comparison, that, as you can judge just from your eye. Um, and let's, let's go to uh, one more example. We'll pull up Plaintiff's Exhibit 536, taken from page 24 of your report. So I don't see any nines on this page. Um, what's going on in this, uh, this cluster? Yeah, so this is a cluster where my algorithm did not gen generate even a single comparison map other than the enacted map itself, uh, which is why these four images here are the same map over and over again. And just so the record clear is clear, we're looking at the Person, Granville, Vance, Warren cluster in the house. Um, and so does that mean in drawing this cluster, the map maker did not make extreme and intentional use of particles and considerations? No, I can't say anything about this cluster. I've literally not compared it to any other possibilities. Um, and if another one of plaintiff's experts determined that this cluster is an outlier, is that in any way inconsistent with your conclusions here? No, my analysis would not impact how you should interpret that at all. All right, let's pull up plaintiff, uh, I'm sorry, pegged in demonstrative D5, which I believe has been marked as plaintiff's exhibit 905. What is this table showing? This is showing the first and second level analysis uh, for each of the county clusters that I analyzed at the request of plaintiff's counsel. Well, I guess this is part one. There's also some on the next part. Um, and this is all the, all the numbers on this, this table are taken from plaintiff's exhibit, exhibits 522 through 533 listed at the bottom there? Yes. All right. I know this may be a little bit tedious, but this is just a demonstrative, and I want to have all these numbers in the record. So can you just read off the, 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 um, the county and the number for first and second anal level analysis? So can I actually just clarify what speed is good for you for nines? <laughs> so you were fine. Oh, fine. Okay. So, uh, so I'm not going to read the, the things in the first column at all. I'm just going to read left number, right number, left number, right number. Is that okay? Okay, 99.9997. Actually, let, can you read the, the, the cluster just okay, so we sorry. know which one corresponds? My apologize. Wake, 99.9997, 99.9991, 99.9991, 99 
Buncombe, 99.9997, 99.999. Alamance, 99.9987, 99.996. Luck Mecklenburg, 99.994, 99.98. Lenore Pitt, 99.97, 99.91. Brunswick, New Hanover, 99.97. 99.91. Forsyth Yadkin, 99.7, 99.1. Pender Columbus Robeson, 98.7, 96. 98.7, 96. Anson Union, 98.5, 95.5. Cumberland, 98.3, 95. Duplin Onslow, 98. 94, Guilford, 93.9, 82. Thank you. And now let's pull up um, plaintiff, uh, pegged in demonstrative D6, which I believe has also been marked as plaintiff's exhibit 906. Is this the continuation of the previous table? Yes. All right. Um, so I see for, um, sorry. I see for these four remaining clusters, for two of them, that's Gaston, Cleveland, and Richmond, Montgomery, Stanley, Cabarrus, Rowan, Davey, you've noted for your second level analysis that there are too few comparison maps. And then, then for the two other clusters, Person, Vance, Granville, Warren, and Franklin, Nash, you've indicated that there are no comparison maps. I think we can understand what that means, but can you just explain it very briefly? Yes, so uh, for, the second, for the second two you listed, there are literally no comparison maps generated by the algorithm other than the enacted map itself and the enacted map itself. And for the first two examples you gave, uh, comparison maps are generated, but there's a very small number of them or they are extremely, extremely similar to the enacted map. And so when they are, when they are few in number or very similar to the, uh, to the enacted map, that prevents you from drawing conclusions at your second level analysis? Yes. Um, let's move now to your, uh, your cluster analysis on the Senate side. And we'll do two examples here of particular interest. Um, let's first pull up Plaintiff's Exhibit 539. Again, we'll, we'll do all the numbers for all the clusters in a moment, so we don't need to read these off, but I think we can all see that there are a lot of nines there. Um, can, can you just explain what we're looking at? This is the cluster analysis for uh, the Franklin Wake uh, County clustering. Uh, yes, uh, it's exactly analogous to the kinds of uh, things we were looking at for the house. Um, so a couple questions about this um, cluster in particular. Um, are you aware that Senator Blue testified last week that um, the legislative defendants authorized Senator Blue to make certain changes to the boundary line between two strongly Democratic districts in this in this cluster? Yes, I was present for that. Um, and are you aware of some question po questions posed to Dr. Mattingly on cross-examination on Friday in which legislative defendants suggested that Senator Blue's changes could possibly account for the unusual partisan characteristics of this cluster? I was present for that also. Um, Based on your experience, um, is it plausible that the changes Senator Blue made could explain your results for this cluster? It's, it's simply not possible. So if you remember how my partisan metric works, my partisan metric that's used for all the comparisons is based on how many seats the Republicans will win on average in a randomly swung election. If I swap VTDs between the two heavy, heavily Democratic districts, it doesn't affect that metric at all. They're winning those two seats anyways. So uh, right, if you imagine I said that when we watch this video, a half dozen or so changes are sufficient to make this, to, to change this map to the point where it's less advantageous to the Republicans forever for the whole movie. So if the first change in that video is between these Democratic districts, yes, that does ha will have no effect because those seats will be won by Democrats no matter what. Um, it's once you start changing these districts which are carefully drawn to maximize the Republicans' chance of winning any seats at all in this cluster that you start uh, changing the map in a way that you can tell uh, is making it consistently less, less advantageous to Republicans. And actually, 
so when I was uh, listening to this testimony of Senator Blue, I remember, I mean, he was talking about, you know, being told uh, that he could make changes between these two districts, but that he couldn't touch the others, these other two districts. And I, I mean, I already talked about this voice in the back of my head saying, don't change the lines. They're exactly where I want them. He had that voice in real life telling him not to change the lines. They were exactly where he wanted them. And, and that, I mean, that's exactly what the analysis picks up on. Um, Excuse me, I uh, want to object and move to strike out as it goes beyond the, uh, the scope of the report and the analysis that Professor Peck would perform in this case. Overruled. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, let's move to one more example from the Senate side. Um, let's pull up Plaintiff's Exhibit 542, taken from page 29 of your report. Yes. So which cluster are we looking at here? Uh, this is the cluster containing, for example, Lee and Sampson counties. Um, and what were you? Lee and Sampson counties. Um, what were the results of your analysis for this cluster? So you can see a funny thing here that for the 32 runs, you got exactly the same answer every time up to the precision being reported here. So it was always 94.7% of the comparison maps were less partisan than the enacted plan. So uh, a funny thing is going on here. The, the algorithm that I used uh, could only generate 18 comparison maps other than the enacted map itself. So including the enacted map, that's 19 maps total. So my algorithm applied to this cluster uh, is just bouncing around between these 19 choices. And what this table is reporting is that out of those 19 maps, which could be found consistent with the districting criteria and the way that I imposed them, the enacted map was the worst. That is 18 19ths, or 94.7% of the maps were less advantageous to Republicans. So in particular, if you drop the enacted map from the comparison set, 100% of the comparisons were less advantageous to Republicans. So you didn't report a second level analysis for this, this cluster? That's right. There's, there were only uh, 18 comparison maps, uh, so I did not do a second level analysis. But we can, uh, can we still glean anything from your analysis about the map of this cluster? Uh, well, to me, it seemed quite notable that among these 19 maps which were generated by my algorithm, the enacted map was the absolute worst. How one interprets that, I guess, is you know, it's up to you. Um, let's pull up Pegden Demonstrative D7, which I believe has also been marked as Plaintiff's Exhibit uh, 907. Um, what does this uh, demonstrative show? Uh, this is the demonstrative showing uh, just the first and level analyses for each of these clusters, which I guess we'll read into the record. We will. And are all the numbers here uh, um, taken from Plaintiff's Exhibit 538 to 544 as listed at the bottom? If that's my report, then that's correct. Yes. Okay. Um, let's, uh, let's have you read the, the results for the top five, so you can skip the bottom two. OK. Franklin Wake, 99.99999. Uh, and sorry, I didn't mean to write on the screen. I don't know how to erase that. Uh, 99.9999985. Mecklenburg, 99.9985. 99.995. Davy Forsyth, 99.993. 99.98. Randolph Alamance Guilford, 99.95. 99.85. Transylvania, et cetera, 99.8, 99.4, Lee Sampson. I, you can stop there. OK, thank you. Um, so just, just to be clear, for the last two, you do not report a second level analysis? That's right. And for Lee Sampson, I think we already talked about that, that cluster. That's the one with the only 18 comparison maps? Yes. Um, and for the last, uh, the last cluster here, which includes Bladen and Pender counties, you report there are no comparison maps? That's right, none at all. And just to remind us all, when your algorithm doesn't generate any comparison maps, that doesn't mean that, um, that, the, uh, that the map was not, in fact, drawn with um, the extreme and intentional use of partisan considerations. No, it simply means that once I bake in all the choices that the map maker made the way that I do, I freeze the, exactly the same counties, exactly the same towns. 
I tie my districting criteria to the characteristics of the enacted map, no changes are possible. All right, I think that's all we have for your report. I want to switch gears a little bit here. Um, and are you aware of an expert report filed um, by legislative defendants expert Janet Thornton in yes, this case? Um, let's pull up pegged in demonstrative D8, which I believe is also marked as plaintiff's exhibit 908. Yeah, so this is the first page of her expert report in this case. And this is her updated report from May? Yes. Um, let's go through some of the things that she says about your analysis. Um, let's go first to page 13. And can you read for us the sentence that begins with the words, a review of? She writes, a review of Dr. Pegden's simulation code suggests that in reality, he did not actually apply a compactness criterion. Is that sentence correct? No, it's not. Why is it not correct? Because I did, exactly as laid out in my report. My code does impose such a constraint. In my rebuttal report, I include snippets of the code. Uh, I include snippets of the code uh, to demonstrate the calculations. And not only was this code provided to the other side, but it's available on my website. Uh, in my report, I also uh, show example figures of what would happen if one didn't apply a compactness criterion. Quite frankly, the comparison districtings would look completely different from what you see in my report. So let's pull up Plaintiff's Exhibit 558, taken from page 19 of your rebuttal report. Can you explain what we're seeing here? So the first row already appeared in my first report. It's the example maps and the enacted map for the Mecklenburg County Senate districting. So the left top map is the enacted plan, and then the next three are representative examples uh, that were output my, by my algorithm. The next row shows what you would get if you did exactly the same thing, but dropped the compactness criterion that I do impose in my analysis. And as you can see, you get what I would call crazy fractal nonsense, right? You get crazy looking districts uh, that would not form a reasonable set of comparisons. And I should say that uh, if you have expertise in the quantitative analysis of distri districtings, this is a standard phenomenon, uh, the fact that this is what you would get without a compactness criterion. So the purpose of this figure is to illustrate that you don't even have to look at my code to tell that I impose a compactness criterion. Looking at the comparison maps that I generate is enough. All right, let's go back to Dr. Thornton's report that's um, pegged to demonstrative D8 or plaintiff's exhibit 908 and turn to page 20. And I'd like you to read for us um, the th starting three lines down in paragraph 57, two sentences starting with, for instance. Okay. For instance, in the case of markup chain Monte Carlo simulations, it is in practice unknown when the equilibrium distribution is reached and the simulation should begin to sample. I'm sorry, yeah. Unknown when the equilibrium distribution is reached and the simulation should begin to sample. It is also difficult to estimate how often the sample should be collected. For this reason, it is almost impossible to prove that the algorithm randomly samples from the entire space of compliant maps. All right, I, I want you to um, explain what, this, um, what these two sentences mean, and maybe you can start by explaining what the word equilibrium means. Yeah, so remember that a markup chain is essentially a random walk around some abstract space be a city, a space of maps, whatever. Uh, if you imagine that you carried out a random walk for long enough, like if you walked randomly around a city for a long time, you'd eventually be at an essentially random place, even if you started at a specific place. And that's a quantifiable statement. That is, doing a random walk for a long time can actually be used to generate random samples in a precise way. When you've run the chain for long enough, it's said to have reached equilibrium. Uh, or an another term for this is to say that the chain has mixed. So the mixing time is how long it takes to reach equilibrium. Uh, so the problem here is that this has nothing to do with how I do my analysis. So if you think back to the first, very first paper we talked about, the title was Assessing Significance in a Markov Chain Without Mixing. Right? So there, significance is statistical significance. Mixing is the same thing, equilibrium, the mixing of the chain. The subject of that paper is proving that you can assess statistical significance in the way that we do 
without caring about equilibrium issues with Markov chains at all. So essentially, I would say that the entire point of uh, my, my academic work with my co-authors in this area is that this thing here about equilibrium has nothing to do with the way we do our analysis. Does Dr. Thornton offer any criticism of the math by which you have you and your co-authors have proved that for your analysis to work, the Markov chain does not need to mix or reach equilibrium? No. All right, let's uh, move on and staying on Pegden Demonstrative D8 or Plaintiff's Exhibit 908, uh, let's move to page 25. And I'd like you to read the last two sentences on page 25, starting with the word rather and then continue reading through the first sentence on page 26. She writes, rather than providing a histogram of his results, similar to those prepared by Dr. Chen and Dr. Manningly, Dr. Pegnan only provides a Sorry, I forgot, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, Dr. Chen and Dr. Manningly, Dr. Pegden only provides a percentage of generator maps that are less Republican than the enacted map. He does not provide any measure of how different the enacted map is from his simulated maps in terms of the estimated number of Democratic House and Senate districts. And then if you could have uh, do, read the first sentence on the next page. She writes, in order to assess this difference, Dr. Pegden's simulation was modified to generate the histogram. All right, so if I understand these sentences, she seems to be saying that, she, that Dr. Thornton ran a new analysis using your code. Is that your understanding? Uh, yes, well, her modification of my code, but yes. Um, in doing that, did she use your code correctly? No, she didn't. Um, let's start at the broadest level. Um, first off, is your algorithm a good way to generate a baseline for the type of comparison that um, Dr. Thornton um, indicates she's um, doing in this, in, in this uh, section here? No, as I discussed earlier, uh, the right way to think about my analysis uh, is as a sensitivity analysis to detect whether the person who drew the map intentionally worked super, super hard to optimize the Republican advantage from that map. It is not to draw a collection of neutral comparisons. In particular, the comparison maps used in my method are all tied to the enacted map, both in terms of how I implemented the criteria, as we discussed, and because they are literally made by making changes to the enacted map. Beyond that uh, kind of fundamental uh, objection to this analysis, uh, did, did, uh, did Dr. Thornton make any other mistakes in how she used your code? Yes. Uh, so, okay, let's start with this one. Um, so, we talked earlier about this distinction between 2011 districts and 2017 districts in terms of when the districts were last redrawn. So this is a distinction that uh, uh, Dr. Thornton doesn't mention in her report. However, uh, looking at the analysis that she, that she did with uh, when, she, when she did this analysis that she's previewing here, she used the wrong command when she ran her modification of my code and so froze every single district which was last changed in the 2011 districting process. That is, despite not discussing the distinction between these two types of districts at all, or doing anything similar in her discussion of other experts' maps, for her analysis of my work, she only allowed changes to the 2017 map. And uh, notice, that's something that I only did on that half a page of the report that was up earlier, right? So, Everything that she did the, from that, the starting point for her was this uh, incorrect choice of freezing the 2011 districts. Um, in the report, did Dr. Thornton provide any explanation for why she froze the 2011 districts? No, I don't even think the, that the, the year 2011, those four characters, appears anywhere in the main body of her report. She really does not draw this distinction that we're talking about. Um, are there any other districts that do not change in her analysis? Yes, yeah, so of course there are other districts that wouldn't change in any analysis. So for example, there are single district county clusters and none of the experts for the plaintiffs uh, have changes to those districts because the comparison maps have to respect the county clustering. This point is relevant here, however, because Dr. Thornton presents 
these districts in figures where she is uh, trying to say something about the extent to which the comparison maps she generates differ from the enacted map. So as, was, as we'll see, this conspires with many other choices she made uh, to downplay the true extent of the differences between the enacted and comparison maps. We'll pull that out a little bit, uh, um, draw that out a little bit more later. Um, are there any more districts beyond those you've already discussed that do not change in her analysis? Uh, yes, yeah, so also, uh, as we discussed earlier, sometimes single move swaps are not sufficient to make changes to uh, districting, but multi-move swaps are. Uh, but Dr. Thornton did not carry out any implementation of single moves, uh, of multi-move swaps in her analysis. And let me point out just that all of these problems are, are so grave for Dr. Thornton because she's interested in doing an analysis to suggest perhaps that the difference between the enacted map and the comparison maps is small. And then anything, so it's the opposite for me, right? For me, I'm advertising, I'm talking all the time about how I've tied the comparison maps to the enacted map. And that makes it all the more remarkable that the enacted map is an outlier. But if you're trying to do the opposite, if you're trying to suggest, as Dr. Thornton is, that the map, that the, that the enacted map is not an outlier, then any way in which you tie the comparison maps to the enacted map is biasing your results in a way that makes your conclusions not reliable. And all of these things we are discussing are of that form. Um, let's move, moving past the particular districts that are frozen in Dr. Thornton's analysis, let's talk about the metric she uses for this comparison um, between the enacted map and the, the alternative maps she generates. Um, if I'm, Reading this right, it says she, she uh, calculates the democratic seat count. Is that your understanding? Yes, that is the concept that she uses. Um, does she use uh, an, um, any sort of uniform swing or random uniform swing like you do in your analysis? No, for her, she simply uses the 2016 attorney general race as an exact proxy for voting patterns and asks in an election which is exactly like that election, how many Democrats would win seats? Oh. No, no, that's, go ahead. Um, and did she do any kind of robustness check in which she reran her analysis using different elections to see if that would make a difference? No, she didn't. Um, what effect does using just a single election with no uniform swing have on her analysis? Well, it's a limitation because it means that she can only understand differences between the enacted plan and her comparisons to the extent that they would be reflected in that single election. And uh, right, I think that the point that is generally understood is that when you're designing a map ahead of time, you don't already know the election results. You're designing a map, if you're gerrymandering for the Republican Party, for example, to sort of stand the test of time, to behave well under a range of election outcomes. And only understanding the properties that a map has with respect to a single election then limits your ability to detect uh, truly how it differs from the comparison maps. So given all of these mistakes that you've now discussed, does Dr. Thornton's analysis presented in, in her report fairly represent the results of your analysis in your reports? I mean, honestly, I really feel like it has almost nothing to do with what I did in my report. Now let's go to the results Dr. Thornton presents for her analysis. Um, in the snippet you were just reading here, um, Dr. Thornton references some histograms. Um, do those histograms appear in her report? No. Despite writing that she uh, was concerned that I didn't show any histograms and that she modified my code to make the histograms, she then didn't show the histograms in her report. Um, I looked at her backup data, though, and the histograms, she did, she did produce histograms, and they were in her backup data. So I uh, reproduced them in my rebuttal report. Um, I, I assume we'll pull them up. Yes, let's look at Plaintiff's Exhibit 552, taken from page 8 of your rebuttal report. Yes, yeah, so this is for the House. So, and just to emphasize, this thing on the left that looks like it's some sort of computer font with asterisks, so this is just something that I copied and pasted from her backup data. This is a histogram that she wrote code to generate and then did not include in her report. On the right, I am just replotting the same thing in a more graphical way. Uh, so you can see, for example, re referencing the right, just because it's easier to see, uh, on the x-axis we have the number of Democratic seats 
measured as Dr. Thornton measures it, just using the 2016 race as an exact proxy for voting patterns. And on the y-axis, we see these percentages. It's measuring the percentage of the comparison maps that she generated that had that many Democratic seats, according to her metric. So for example, according to her metric, 54% of her comparison maps had 48 seats. All right, I see on this, um, this histogram that um, the one on the right, that the number 44 is in red. What does that indicate? That indicates that that is the number of seats Dr. Thornton uh, calculated with her method for the enacted map. That is, if I just count up the Democratic districts according to the 2016 Attorney General race in the enacted map, that number is 44. And you can see that in Dr. Thornton's comparison set, only which includes the enacted map and a bunch of things which are just a few changes away from it. Only one in a hundred thousand maps in her comparison set had as few Democratic seats as the enacted map. And now, uh, just one broader point to make sure we're clear: this plot, this is this is the changes. Even if we after we've frozen the 2011 districts and there are no changes to the to the single district clusters and also no changes where multi-move swaps are required. Yes, so I checked her backup data. Only 61 districts undergo changes at all in her analysis from the results in her backup. And even just only analyzing half of the house, essentially, she, she's finding that her comparison maps have, this 48, uh, have 48 Democratic seats. The enacted map is at 44, and only one in 100,000 of her comparison maps are so uh, are as advantageous to the Republicans using this simplistic seat measure that she's chosen. I see that the histogram here starts at 44, and there's no numbers uh, lower than that. There's no 43 or 42, et cetera. Um, what does that indicate? So uh, that, yeah, that's because that in the two trillion maps that she generated, she didn't encounter a single better map for the Republicans than the enacted map, according to her metric. That is, there wasn't even one map in her collection of two trillion maps for which there were only 43 Democratic seats. 44 was as good as it got for the Republicans. Um, does this histogram show that the difference in Democratic seats between the enacted map and the alternative maps that Dr. Thornton generated is statistically significant? So I should start by saying, uh, as we've discussed, she's made what I would say are you know, various crucial methodological errors, and is even using my algorithm in a way in which it's not intended to be used to draw you know, neutral comparison maps. However, if you put that aside and accept her comparison set as a random sample of maps, then absolutely, this would be a hugely statistically significant, significantly, uh, sorry, hugely statistically significantly different uh, finding for the seats. Because what we see here is that only one in 100,000 of the comparison maps have as few Democratic seats as the enacted map. In particular, that means that if you randomly chose one of Dr. Thornton's maps, the maps that she generated, it would only have a one in 100,000 chance of being as uh, favorable to the Republicans as the enacted map. So that corresponds to a p-value of p equals 0. 0.00001. That's just translating. So a percentage here, the percentage is 0. 0.001. The p-value has two extra zeros because it's a number between 0 and 1 instead of 0 and 100. Um, and is there any sophisticated mathematics or statistics necessary to do the calculation of statistical significance you just explained? I'm sorry. Is there any sophisticated mathematics or statistics necessary to do the calculation of statistical significance that you just explained? No, this is sort of the, the most simple kind of statistical significance calculation. Um, it would be sort of the prototypical example you would give to illustrate even what the concept means. Um, let's move now to Plaintiff's Exhibit 553, also taken from page eight of your rebuttal report. We don't have to go into this in, in as much detail, but br briefly, what is this? This is the same thing, but for the Senate. So you can again see, uh, well, in this case, you can see that the largest part of her maps had 23 Democratic seats. The enacted map calculated using her method has 20 seats, and only 0.182% of her comparison set had as few Democratic seats as the enacted map. 
Finally, again, the chart is cut off below 20, and that's because in the more than 2 trillion maps that she generated when she ran her modification by algorithm, she didn't see even one single map as uh, advantageous to the Republicans. Oh, sorry, more advantageous to the Republicans, that is, with fewer Democratic seats as the enacted map. And just to make, uh, not to belabor the point, but the analysis that underlies these results has all of the problems, the same problems underlying it that you described before. Yes, and just to emphasize also, I am not plotting an analysis here that I've done at all. That histogram on the left came from her backup data, and I have just plotted it on the right. Um, and again, this shows, uh, does this show that the, the difference in seat count on the Senate side that, that Dr. Thornton generates is, is, um, is statistically significant? Yes. So here the p-value would be 0 .00182 because that's the fraction of maps with as few Democratic seats. All right. So now I'm uh, changing gears just a little bit. Um, Dr. Thornton in her report raises some questions about the statistical significance of some of, uh, of results generated using your algorithm as well as those generated by the algorithms of Dr. Chen and Dr. Manningly. Um, before we get into that, I'd, I'd lock, like to talk about um, some things that are not in her report. Um, so in, in your report, you, re you report measures of statistical significance for your results, p-values, is that right? Yes. Um, does Dr. Thornton dispute the accuracy of those p-values in any way? No. All right. With that out of the way, let's go back to Dr. Thornton's report. That's um, Plaintiff's Exhibit 908. And I'd like you to read two related passages on, on pages 24 and 25, and then I'll have you explain them to us. Um, so let's start on page 24, four lines down from the top. Can you read the sentence that begins with the word generally? Yes. She writes, generally, social scientists and the courts conclude the differences between two groups, e.g. enacted and simulated plan Democratic districts are statistically similar when the difference in terms of the number of standard deviations is less than approximately two parenthetical or three standard deviations. And then down towards the bottom of the page, um, can you read the sentence that starts on page 24 and continues on to page 25? Yeah, she writes, I used the binomial distribution to determine if the difference between the number of Democratic seats from the enacted map is statistically significantly different from the number based on the simulated maps. Okay, I'd like you to uh, unpack some of this for us. Let's start with the term standard deviation. What does that term mean? Right, so if I have a collection of data points, so just a collection of numbers, the mean of the data is simply the average of the numbers. That's something that uh, we've all learned how to calculate. The standard deviation is another simple parameter which just tells us how spread out the data is. So for example, if I have a collection of data that's just the same number over and over again, the standard deviation will be zero because the data points don't differ from the mean at all. If I have a collection of data points that are spread out widely, then the standard deviation would be large. And it's, again, measuring how spread out the data is. Um, how does the term standard deviation relate to the term statistical significance? So if you make assumptions about the distribution from which something is being drawn, then you can make claims of statistical significance uh, by counting how many standard deviations away an observation is from the mean. So if you make an observation and it's four standard deviations away from the mean and you've assumed, for example, that you're working with a normal distribution, then that would be statistically significant. Um, is the method of uh, calculating statistical significance that you just described, counting the number of standard deviations between an observed uh, uh, event and the mean, is that how Dr. Thornton calculates statistical significance in her report? Uh, that's how she presents her analysis. I, I don't want to go too far saying that she actually does this because she hasn't actually calculated the standard deviation of the data that she's working with. So what if, if she doesn't calculate the standard deviation, what does she do instead? Yeah, so she does something uh, quite unusual. Instead, she assumes and uh, gives no reason for this assumption that the comparison maps that uh, she's working with are generated from a specific distribution, which is called the binomial distribution. That's what she writes here. I use the binomial distribution. So here she's just making an assumption. She's declaring, I assume the maps 
and their, and their properties are drawn from this distribution. And then using that assumption, she just uses the standard deviation of the binomial distribution, which has the same average as her comparison set. And this standard deviation is completely different from the true standard deviation of the data. And then she purports to carry out significance calculations of the type we described, but using this completely incorrect value for the standard deviation. All right, we're gonna, we're gonna unpack that, but I think to, to make it more clear, let's pull up um, Plaintiff's Exhibit 554, taken from page 10 of your rebuttal report. And John, if we could put that side by side with Plaintiff's Exhibit 552. Yeah, so okay. on the right here, we are seeing this thing that we looked at before. In particular, that was Dr. Thornton's histogram, the one that I just re reproduced from her backup data. Here, actually, can I interject for just a moment? John, can we um, highlight the, um, the histogram on the right in 552? So this is the one you, you recreated. Yep. Yes, this, can we, this is can fine. We, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, continue, Dr. Pegg. Okay. Yeah, so uh, on the left, the first thing to notice is that the gray bars appear again. That's just exactly the same gray bars. I'm reproducing this histogram again on the left. What I show in blue here is the binomial distribution that Dr. Thornton works with. In particular, all this figure is intended to communicate is that the blue bars do not look like the gray bars. That is the essence of Dr. Thornton's assumption, that instead of calculating the standard deviation, of these gray bars, the, her comparison set of maps, she can assume, without any explanation, a completely different distribution for how political maps of North Carolina behaves. And that's that distribution she assumes, the binomial distribution. And of course, what you see here, just with your eyes, is that the standard deviation of the binomial distribution, the blue bars, is much, much larger than the actual standard deviation of the maps. That is, by making this incorrect assumption, she has allowed herself to inflate the standard deviation to a much larger number. Um, let's, uh, we'll go to those numbers in just a second, but I want to um, note one thing first. So a moment ago, you were saying that in all of the alternative maps Dr. Thornton generated, not a single one had a Democratic seat count lower than 44. Do I have that right? That's correct, and on the other hand, you'll see that the blue bars are quite happy living in the region below 44. That is a significant fraction of the weight of the distribution which Dr. Thornton has assumed lives below 44 C. Now, did you calculate the actual standard deviation of the gray bars and the blue bars? And for, for this, I'll uh, direct your attention to, I believe it's pages 11 and 12 of your rebuttal report. Yes, so let me find the values on that page. Um, yes, yeah, so the actual standard deviation of her map set, that is the gray bars, is 0.778. The value that she incorrectly works so this is at the bottom of page 11, the value that she incorrectly works with, you can find on the top of page 12, is around 5.35. So that's the value that you get by instead of working with the actual map distribution, assuming that it behaves like this blue distribution. So, so in other words, Dr. Thornton used a standard deviation that is in fact about six times larger than the actual standard deviation of the distribution of her alternative maps? Yes, she did. How does that, uh, does that bias Dr. Thornton's results in one way or the other? Yes, dramatically. So remember, her entire approach to calculating statistical significance is to ask how many standard deviations away something is from the mean. If your standard deviation is six times larger than it's supposed to be, then you will be six times fewer standard deviations away than you actually are. So it's just, a, I mean, it completely throws everything off. Is it an accepted practice in redistricting analysis to assume that the Democratic seat count across a set of alternative possible maps follows a binomial distribution? No, it's, it's not. And I mean, that's an understatement. It's not just that it's not accepted practice. It's that it, it really makes no sense. The entire, so, I mean, can I talk about what the binomial distribution Let, is? I'll ask you some questions okay, to set this sure. up. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, what are the conditions under which a data set follows a binomial distribution? So the binomial distribution is a distribution that tells you how many outcomes you'll have from a set of independent identical experiments. So the standard example is I flip 100 coins. And each coin I flip has some fixed probability of coming up heads each time. So maybe they all have 50% probability of being heads or 40%, doesn't matter. But it has to be the same for all of them. But it has to be the same for all of them. So I have, let's say, 100 coins that I flipped. I carried out this experiment. And maybe one time I do this, I got 40 heads. The next time I got 47 heads. The next time I got 37 heads. These numbers, 40, 47, 37, would be drawn from a binomial distribution because they are the sum total of successful outcomes from a collection of independent, identical experiments. And that is the only setting in which the binomial distribution exactly characterizes uh, the outcome of an experiment when it's the result of independent, identical experiments. And it only approximates the outcome of the distribution if that assumption is at least reasonably approximately true. And as I hope we'll discuss now, that's not the case at all in the case of maps. Let's start with the independence assumption. So if I understand you correctly, in her binomial distribution, Dr. Thornton effectively chose to assume that whether Democrats win a given district is completely independent of whether they will win, say, a neighboring district. Is that right? That's right, and just to emphasize what we're talking about here, the map and not the election is what we're perturbing, right? So it's, suppose I have some county cluster and I'm going to choose a random map of the state, right? Because that's what's varying in her histogram, it's the maps. It's always the same election, the maps are varying, okay? So I'm gonna choose a random map of, of this cluster. And the assumption would have to be that whether district one in my random map is a democratic district is independent that means it doesn't affect the probability that District 2 would be a Democratic district. And that's patently false. So for example, suppose, I mean, each Democratic voter that I put in District 1, I put in to the exclusion of putting that Democratic voter in District 2. So these events are intertwined. And I mean, I can also give a, a simple example. Suppose I have a, a county cluster where the way Dr. Thornton me measures Democratic seats, uh, Democrats have 51% uh, of the vote overall in the cluster, okay? Uh, now, in her analysis, she would assume that the probability that each district is a Republican district is independent. They just behave like coin flips, which would certainly mean that there's a decent chance Republicans would win both districts because they're behaving like coin flips. But if there's a 51% Democratic vote share in the cluster, Democrats, they can't both be Republican districts because if Republicans have a majority in both districts of the cluster, they have to have a majority overall in the cluster. So what this shows is that, uh, I mean, just very simply, it's a simple point. When I'm placing districts, where I put one district affects where I put another. And it's simply not true at all that they behave like coin flips. All right, let's move now to the second assumption you talked about, and that's that that has to be the same probability in each instance of, that, you're, that, you're, that you're analyzing. Yes. Um, so if I, if I understand this correctly, in her binomial distribution, Dr. Thornton effectively chooses to assume that Democrats have the same probability of winning any seat out of the 120 House seats in North Carolina or any of the 50 Senate seats. Is that right? Yes, that's how binomial distributions work. So she's effectively assumed that uh, Democrats have the same chance of winning a seat in, say, Wake County as they do in, say, Caldwell County. Exactly. Is that a reasonable assumption? It doesn't seem like a reasonable assumption to me. Um, let me ask you a few questions to understand how serious of a mistake this is. Um, does Dr. Thornton's report provide any explanation for why she doesn't just calculate the actual standard deviation of the actual distribution of her actual results? No, she gives no explanation for why she doesn't do that. And she gives no justification for why using the binomial distribution could at all be considered remotely reasonable in the setting of analyzing maps. Does she cite any scholarly literature to justify this methodological choice? No, she wouldn't have been able to. Are you aware of any such literature? No. Are you aware of anyone ever in, in, in who engages in quanti quantitative um, analysis of districting maps 
other than Dr. Thornton who has ever assessed the statistical significance of seat counts in this way. No, Dr. Thornton is the only person I know of that has ever done anything like this. Does Dr. Thornton's um, report discuss the two assumptions underlying the binomial distribution that we discussed? Uh, no, she doesn't. Um, does she acknowledge that her, uh, her binomial, binomial distribution assumes that the probability that a Democrat will win one district is effectively independent is, is independent of the probability that they will win a neighboring district? No. Does she acknowledge that her binomial distribution assumes that Democrats have the same probability of winning uh, a seat in, say, Wake County as in, say, Caldwell County? No. Is there anything specific about your algorithm that makes uh, using the binomial distribution a poor assumption? No. Analyzing maps at all in any setting in a way which uses the binomial distribution as Dr. Thornton uses it throughout her report uh, makes no sense. And this would be the case whether it was in her reply to me or anybody else. So if um, Dr. Thornton were to use a binomial distribution to assess the statistical significance of seat counts for alternative maps generated by Dr. Chen's algorithm or Dr. Mattingly's algorithm, all the same problems would apply? Absolutely. And right. There might even be further problems that I haven't got right here. In addition to this problem, she made all sorts of other mistakes with my analysis. So I'm not getting into that, but these problems would all certainly apply. Let's now pull up plaintiff's exhibit 555 taken from page 11 of your rebuttal report. So what's this? This is exactly the same thing, for, but for the Senate, the gray bars are the gray bars from the histogram from her report. The blue bars are the binomial distribution, she assumes, for the Senate. And again, the salient point here is that the gray bars do not look like the blue bars. The only difference in this figure from the previous figure, apart from the fact that it's Senate data instead of, uh, uh, instead of for the House, is there are also these shaded regions to the left and right. So this is a, an is interesting extra analysis that I did for the Senate. For the Senate, it's possible to prove that if one uses the 2016 Attorney General race as your exact proxy for voting data, okay. for voting data, it is actually impossible to draw any districting of uh, North Carolina for the Senate, which would give the Democrats fewer than 17 seats. So in that shaded region, the region I've shaded on the left there, I can mathematically prove that there are no maps in that region. And just to emphasize, it might be that there are also no maps past that. Like even up to 17, 18, or 19, as far as I know, nobody's ever seen a map of the North Carolina Senate, which would only give the Democrats 19 seats. So Dr. Thornton generated two trillion maps and didn't see even one map like that. But what I'm saying about the shaded region is that I have an absolute mathematical proof that no districtings belong to the shaded region. The relevance here is that there are blue bars in the shaded region. Of course there are, because if I flip coins, there's always some chance I just get 16 heads. And she thinks that the districts are behaving like coin flips. Um, using the, the standard deviation that, um, that Dr. Thornton uh, used based on the binomial distribution, is it, would it be possible for her to conclude that any possible redistricting map of the North Carolina Senate is an outlier? No, so this is in page 12 of my rebuttal report, the, the title that I used for the section where I did this extra analysis with these shader regions was, no Senate districting exists, which would be called gerrymandered by Thornton's analysis. And that's because with her incorrect value for the standard deviation, even if Democrats had only one seven, even if the enacted map was even worse than it was. It's a different map that's even worse. Somebody found one that would only give the Democrats 17 seats under the attorney general race. That's not good enough for Dr. Thornton's analysis because she's used this incorrect standard deviation. And there are no maps that are worse, right? There's no maps where they would only have 16 seats. So what this proves, it's an absolute mathematical proof that there, she could not have done her analysis with any map, the enacted map or any map, and called it a gerrymander. Uh, in her report, does Dr. Thornton also describe performing a test of two proportions? Yes, she does. 
Does a test of two proportions effectively assume that the data one is analyzing follows a binomial distribution? Yes, in particular, the core assumptions are still these assumptions of independence and identical probabilities. So in her test of two proportions, Dr. Thornton, again, effectively chose to assume that the probability of a Democrat winning a given district is independent of the probability of winning a neighboring district. Yes. And that, and that assumption is not reasonable in your view. Absolutely not. So in particular, these figures are still showing you what's wrong with that test as well. Right? The fact that this binomial distribution here does not reasonably approximate this histogram is also an, it, it's an equivalent demonstration for the test of two proportions. In her test of two proportions, Dr. Thornton also again effectively assumes that Democrats have the same probability of winning a district in, say, Wake <coughs> County as in Caldwell County. Yes. So Dr. Test, Dr. Thornton's test of two proportions has all of the same problems that are illustrated by these figures with the blue and gray bars. Yes, and, and, and perhaps the simplest way to emphasize this is just to say that when she does this analysis, like when she does her uh, analysis, which purports to use the binomial distribution this way, she doesn't use anything about the map she's generated other than the average number of Democratic seats. That is, she doesn't calculate a standard deviation or anything else about the map set. She just takes the average number of seats in her comparison plans, the number of seats in the enacted plan, and everything else follows from those two numbers. Like somehow, the way to understand this is Dr. Thornton's analysis is just based essentially on the question, is 44 very different from 48? But she asks and answers this question in a way which is completely devoid of anything that depends on the fact that these are seats, that we're talking about maps, that the maps are in particular about North Carolina. These are, she's just done analysis, is 48 very, di very different from 44? And her, the context in which she does these calculations doesn't use anything else. She's only using these two numbers and asking, are they different? Let's step, step back for a moment and pull up um, pegged in demonstrative PD9 or um, uh, plaintiff's exhibit uh, 909. Um, what is this? Um, what is this demonstrative showing? This is just uh, sort of a top line summary of some of the biggest problems that we covered with the approach that she brings to doing uh, what she calls the statistical significance analysis. Um, can you go through them just very quickly? Yes. Yeah, so uh, first of all, uh, I did statistical significance in, uh, analysis in my report, and I did it correctly using mathematical theorems which have, absolute, which, which have proofs, right? These are theorems that are true. And she just, she didn't dispute those at all. She didn't explain why they're wrong. She just then did her own analysis. In her own analysis, she did it incorrectly, right? She didn't actually calculate the, the standard deviation of her results. It, so, I mean, if you were to tell somebody how would you do this analysis that she's trying to do without calculating the standard deviation, you have to get the standard deviation from somewhere. She incorrectly assumed that the results follow a binomial distribution and just used oh, that, she? sorry, incorrectly assumed that the results follow a binomial distribution and just used that standard deviation instead. Instead of calculating one, she just used one from a different distribution. Uh, and in doing so, she had to ignore the obvious flaws with this assumption. In particular, she had to ignore that the district events are not independent and that they're not identical. All right, let's shift gears a little bit and go to a, a, some other results that are presented in Dr. Thornton's report. Let's go to peg the demonstrative D8 again. Uh, this is uh, or plaintiff's exhibit 908 and go to page 28. All right, so there's a lot going on here. Before we get into the, even the title of this, um, can you just orient us and, and tell us what the vertical and horizontal axes are and what these green and orange lines are? Yes, so uh, the horizontal axis here is house district numbers. The vertical axis, uh, the vertical axis is percentages. Um, so 
these are percent, the percentages are percent Democratic vote share. So the green line is supposed to be a line for the enacted plan. So this is supposed to show you the percent Democratic vote share in the enacted plan. And then the orange line, the percent Democratic vote share in the enacted plan. And the orange line is to show you the percent Democratic vote share in the average of Dr. Thornton's uh, comparison maps. And just to emphasize, she's written here my name several times, but the comparison maps she's analyzing are the ones that she generated. So again, for example, all 2011 districts were frozen uh, in her analysis. And this is the code that she modified. All right, so let's go through some of those things. At this point, let's, can you just read the, the title of this figure for us? Comparison, she writes, comparison of the enacted map and the average across Dr. Pegden's simulations for each non-frozen house district. Let's start with the word Dr. Pegden's simulations. Is that uh, an accurate description of what this conveys? No, as I just said, she is actually analyzing her comparison districtings. And I see that it says each non-frozen house district. Is that accurate? No, so she has omitted from the x-axis districts which she explicitly froze on the command line, but these are the 2011 districts. She has included districts in this figure which are frozen for other reasons. So for example, frozen by the county cluster rule. Uh, even though in her, so there's some sort of confusion at play here, I think, because in her report, she indicates that she thinks, this is in a footnote on page five or six, she thinks that the districts that she's freezing when she runs this command is uh, the districts frozen by the county clustering. But really, she's frozen the 2011 districts, though she's not showing, and she's still showing the districts frozen by the county clustering. So um, I, th I think the most salient thing that, that jumps out at me when I look at this, this line plot are all these dips and uh, these, these peaks and valleys and, and jumps. Do those indicate something important about this data? Yeah, so I agree. When you look at this first, it seems like the fact that these lines are jumping all over the place should indicate something. And, and no, in this case, it really doesn't, though. It, it, the point is here, we're plotting data for which using a line plot makes no sense. Because observe, there's no time order to this data. When you use a line plot, you're plotting something like unemployment data over time, or data for things ranked from least to greatest, something like that. There has to be some sense to the order. The order of the data you're plotting has to be relevant. For example, if somebody snuck into the legislative offices and renumbered the districts from least Democratic vote share to greatest Democratic vote share, that wouldn't, they, all they've done is they've renumbered the districts. It doesn't matter at all. It's exactly the same map. And this plot would look completely different. The lines would just gradually rise from low to high. There would be no peaks or valleys at all. So the peaks and valleys in this figure convey no information because the order in which the uh, district numbers on the x-axis come is not meaningful to uh, where we should expect there to be Democratic vote share. So all of this is an artifact of the, of the fact that the, the horizontal axis here is district number, which is essentially just a name assigned by, um, by the map drawers. Right. There's no, there's no uh, import to be given to the order. And uh, for that reason, it's not sensible, in my opinion, to use a line plot to graph this data. Um, beyond that, uh, are there any other flaws that you um, detect in this line plot? Yeah. So first of all, I mean, there's a simple point, which is that you don't need the full range uh, used here, like 0 to 100 percent. Much of this range is unoccupied, but she includes all of it. Much of this space is unoccupied, but she includes all of it. The lines are also unusually thick. Um, and I mean, at first, maybe this sounds like small points, but it's really not. So especially the fact that these peaks are here, these peaks, which mean nothing, are here, and they're drawn with these thick lines, mean that, for example, if you look at some of these peaks, the green line at the peak obscures six or seven percentage points of the vertical space of the plot, making it look like there is no difference between the green and orange line, when in fact the difference might be large. So just to make sure I understand, you, you understand the point of this plot to be showing the difference between the green line and the orange line. That is the information you understand Dr. Thornton to be conveying with this plot. Yes, and she wishes us to take away from this, I think, 
that the difference between the green line and orange line is not great. So let's, let's take a particular example and see if you can walk through how the design choices of this chart obscure the actual results of Dr. Thornton's analysis. Okay, so this is more homework, but I'd like us all to just try to figure out for District 11, how different are the green and orange line? And not to give away the answer here, but when I look at this, I cannot really tell that there's much of a difference at all between the green line and orange line. Like looking at District 11, I mean, Dr. Thornton almost has me convinced. Maybe they aren't that different. All right, let's pull up at this point, Plaintiff's Exhibit 556. And let's focus on the, the uh, figure at the top there. What are we looking at here? So this is again a case where I've simply replotted Dr. Thornton's data. So here I've just made a bar chart of the difference between the Democratic vote share and the enacted and uh, and the enacted plan and the average of her comparison plans. So let's let's slow down there for just a second. So the x-axis here is still the, the numbers along the x-axis here are still district numbers, but they're not in numerical order. That's right. I've sorted them from greatest difference to smallest difference. And on the vertical axis here, we're not talking absolute vote share. We're talking about the difference between the green bar, the green line, and the orange line in the previous plot. Yes, this is, a, this is how many percentage points different the two are. Right, for example, if the green line was at 50% and the orange line was at 47% for some district, that would correspond to 3% in this plot. All right, you were talking about District 11. That's right, so if you look at my plot, you can very easily see that for District 11, there is actually a 3.5 percentage point difference between the enacted plan and the average of the comparison plans. That means that in that line plot, even though you can't see it when you look at it, or even though I can't see it when I look at it at least, there's actually a 3.5 percentage point difference. And just to emphasize, this is the difference in the Democratic vote share. The difference in the margin between the two parties would be a 7% difference, right? There'd be a 7 percentage point difference in the vote margin. Okay, now I'm not a politician, but uh, to me, 7 percentage point difference seems quite large. Uh, I know that in the 35th House District, for example, in 2018, I believe the election was decided by a 0.2% vote margin. Did Dr. Thornton produce a similar line plot to the last one we were looking at for, the, for her results for the Senate? Yes. Does that line plot have all the same problems as the ones we've just looked at for the House? Yes, all the same problems. So in your view, does, do those line plots um, uh, fairly represent the results of Dr. Thornton's analysis? No. Well, no, no, I mean, not at all. I think that they present a very misleading picture of what are actually, as you can see in my plots, uh, large, meaningful differences uh, in the Democratic vote shares. All right, the one final point from Dr. Thornton's report. Um, let's go to page 30 of her report. That's um, Plaintiff's Exhibit 908, page 30. All right, and I want to look at this um, table that Dr. Thornton has here. Um, there's a lot going on in this table, and so uh, I'd like you to go slowly for us. Um, just, just to set it up for you, I can see that the top part of this table is talking about certain House districts and the bottom portion is talking about certain Senate districts. Why don't we focus on the top part about the House, if you could try to walk us through uh, very slowly what, what this, um, what this uh, table is presenting as you understand it. Yes. So uh, recall, and we're just doing the example of the House, and Dr. Thornton's House, we're just doing the example of the House. Uh, Dr. Thornton identified a four-seat difference between the enacted plan and the comparison maps so in let me, her analysis. Let me interject there and just so, to refresh our memory. If I recall, there was an average of 48 seats. Right, exactly. On average, there were 48 seats. The enacted plan had 44. And again, all of this is subject to the caveats that she made mistakes, like freezing all 2011 districts. Now, what she set up in this table is four districts, which she views as some, I think the point is that these are somehow responsible for the difference between 44 and 48. That is, these are four districts where you can see they were all Republican in the enacted map based on how she measures partisanship. John, can we, can we uh, highlight the, the row yeah. there that says estimated party based on enacted map? They were all Republican districts in the enacted map. And then these are four districts which if you 
average all of the comparison maps, Democratic vote shares. It's kind of a, an unusual thing to do, but if you did that, then these would all have Demo these would all be Democratic districts in that average. So in one way of looking at it that she's choosing here, these are somehow the four districts that swing from Republican to Democrat when you move from the enacted map to the comparison maps. And um, what, what, uh, what are we seeing? So I, I believe so far you've been comparing the, the, highlighted row, the highlighted column and the column to the left of that. Do I have that right? Yes. Okay. And what are we seeing in the column that is to the right of the highlighted column? So I, here... I, and just for, so the record is clear, the, the column I'm asking Dr. Pegden about is the column entitled Actual Party of, of Elected in 2018. So here she's just showing uh, who won districts 35, 36, 75, and 104 in the enacted map, of course, uh, in the actual 2018 legislative elections. And her point, I think, here is that uh, the yellow column uh, doesn't match the blue column very well here. That is that uh, this method of estimating Democratic districts using the 2016 Attorney General race gave the wrong answer for the 2018 election. So wh what do you think we should take away from this chart? Well, so at the outset when we started talking about this, I think I tried to make the point that I disagree with this choice of using the 2016 Attorney General race just one election to simply predict district outcomes and count up Democratic districts. It's not something that I did anywhere in, in my first report. In my report, I used uh, metrics which incorporated election swings to understand how elections, be how maps behave under a range of election outcomes. And I think basically, to me, this table is an illustration of why I was right. That this table shows you that Dr. Thornton's method of using the 2016 Attorney General race gave her the wrong answer if she's trying to predict a Democratic district or a Republican district. And this concept of what is a Democratic district or a Republican district, I mean, it's simply too brittle to just take this as your metric and use it. And this is why all the quantitative experts that we've seen here applied a uniform swing at some point in their analysis to understand how maps behave under a range of elections. And you've talked about this already, but um, just to, to pull back, um, all of this analysis that she's doing here, she's using your simulated map, or not your simulated, simulated maps, but maps generated by your algorithm as a kind of baseline to, com to use to compare the enacted map. Do I have that right? Yes, I mean, again, she's modified my code, so I would certainly not be prepared to testify about all the ways in which her algorithm might be different. But yes, the, the basis and what she claims to be doing is using my algorithm. And, and is that a, an appropriate use of your algorithm? No, it's not. So again, the way to think about my algorithm is, as a, is a way to do sensitivity testing on the district to understand, did somebody go in a room with a book of partisan data and then carefully draw those lines as well as they could? And obviously, a book here is probably a computer. But in any case, that's the point, right? We're trying to understand, did, were these lines carefully crafted to maximize partisan advantage? The comparison maps that I use are all tied to the enacted map. They're very similar to the enacted map in various ways, which makes my analysis all the more striking. But it also means that you should not use my method in this way uh, to try to understand how the enacted map would compare with a neutral map. So overall, based on your experience in probability and redistricting analysis, is Dr. Thornton's analysis that presented in her, in her report using your algorithm a reasonable, appropriate way to evaluate the partisan characteristics of the enacted maps in North Carolina? No, it's, it has, she made several very serious methodological errors. Um, and for this last point here, let's pull up Plaintiff's Exhibit 552 and 553 one more time, uh, side by side. So despite all of her mistakes that you've described in your testimony so far, is there still anything useful that we can glean from the analysis Dr. Thornton performed using your algorithm? Well, the thing that strikes me is 
that despite all the mistakes that she made, despite the fact that she was doing this analysis, she couldn't help reach essentially the same conclusion as the plaintiff's experts, which is that the enacted maps of North Carolina are extreme, statistically significant outcomes with respect to how they advantage the Republican Party. And in particular, I mean, this just gets back to the basic point. These maps are so gerrymandered that no matter how you do the analysis, no matter who does the analysis, no matter which side is doing the analysis, you reach the same answer with any analysis that you do. All right, let's step back from Dr. Thornton's analysis and set it aside for, for, uh, for now, uh, well, actually for good at this point, um, and return to your analysis. And I just have a few questions to sum up. Um, so what are the overall conclusions that we should draw from your analysis presented in your reports? The overall conclusions you should draw are that the enacted House and Senate maps of North Carolina uh, were drawn with the intentional and extreme use of partisan data to optimize Republican partisan advantage. The maps are among the most carefully crafted maps for Republican and partisan advantage which exist. And could this unusual feature of the maps be explained by North Carolina's political geography or any of the nonpartisan constraints that you imposed in your algorithm? No, nothing about, uh, so everything about the way I do this uh, makes it an apples to apples comparison. So for example, um, the comparison maps that I use are all maps of the same state or the same county cluster. They're subject to the same political geography. Uh, the same voting data is used when evaluating the enacted map against the comparison maps. And, and moreover, there's a broader point that the theorems that I apply don't depend, uh, allow you to make a statement which doesn't depend on the political geography at all. So for example, I was making uh, uh, you know, dramatic claims earlier about how restaurants uh, can be distributed in cities. But I'm not a city planner. I have no special knowledge about where people like to put restaurants of different types. But I can prove mathematically that you don't have cities where a typical restaurant is a bad restaurant surrounded by good restaurants. And so the, the way we're doing this analysis and the theorems that we're applying all mean that uh, political geography cannot explain what we're seeing. Um, if this, the, the, this feature of the maps that they are carefully crafted for Republican partisan advantage can't be explained by political geography and can't be explained by the nonpartisan constraints that you apply in your algorithm, what's the alternative? It's that somebody used partisan data to optimize the partisan performance of the maps. In other words, they did it on purpose? Yes. Um, one final question. Does your analysis shed light on whether it is possible for the maps of the House and Senate in North Carolina to make extreme and intentional use of partisan considerations, even within the constraints of the whole county rule and the other nonpartisan uh, constraints you apply? Sorry, I lost the beginning of the question. Can you I'll, I'll restate it. Yeah. Does your analysis shed light on whether it is possible for the maps of the North Carolina House and Senate to make extreme and intentional use of partisan considerations, even within the constraints of the whole county rule and the other nonpartisan constraints you apply in your algorithm. Yes, I, I, all the analysis I did imposed the whole county rule and the other nonpartisan criteria. So all of the statements I'm making are about how the enacted map compares to other maps which respect those criteria. Thank you very much. No further questions. Thank you, sir. All right, it's 12.50. We'll go ahead and recess. Uh, for lunch at this time and resume at 2.20.